So, ladies and gentlemen, the clock is now 2 p.m. and uh, we would like to, to start. So, on behalf of the European Commission, I'm very pleased to welcome you all to this uh, afternoon conference called Key Competences for All, Policy Design and Implementation in Europe. My name is Carsten frölich Hogor. I'm a director at the Danish Technological Institute and I have the pleasure of uh, guiding you through this afternoon. Together with my uh, colleagues from the European Institute of Education and Social Policy and the Chorus, uh, DCI has been part of the study which forms the basis of this conference. Um, before I walk you through the agenda, I would like to remind you of a few uh, housekeeping rules. I'm sure that we have all uh, got used to digital meetings, but but nevertheless. So uh, please turn off your microphone and also your camera unless you are presenting uh, or you are part of a panel debate. And if you would like to ask questions, please uh, use the, the raise hand function, which you will find in the top panel. Um, we will try to, to monitor all the time if you would like to uh, say a few words. Um, it's also possible to ask uh, questions uh, through the chat. We will also be monitoring the chat all the time. I cannot promise that we uh, have time to address all questions because we have limited time, but we'll do our best to, to address uh, all questions. Now, uh, turning to the agenda, uh, Christian, could we please have, have the slides uh, up again? Just briefly going through uh, the agenda of this uh, afternoon. Uh, in a few minutes, I am very pleased to welcome uh, Themis Christofido, who is the Director General of the European Commission GGEAC, and she will uh, give us the welcoming address. Uh, after this uh, speech, uh, we will look into the key findings of the study uh, and the recommendations and the policy guidelines. And this uh, presentation will be provided by Janet Looney, who is uh, the, the project director of the study, and Magello Shear has been the project manager. This will be followed by uh, some reflections on the recommendations, uh, which will be facilitated by Professor Kay Livingston. Uh, first, we have uh, invited Professor Dr. Edith uh, Hooch to, to give some uh, short reflections. And this will follow by a panel debate. Uh, and the panel consists of, as you can see, Michael uh, Teusch from the European Commission, Elisabeth Alla from the Danish Ministry of Education and Training, uh, Maria Emilia Santos from uh, the Portuguese uh, National Education Council. And then finally, we also have um, a presentation from uh, Dr. Drahoslava uh, Kekosova. Uh, she will not attend this meeting, but she has sent us an audio file. So thank you very much for that. So, so next uh, slide, please. Around uh, 3.30, we will have a short break for about 15 minutes. And after the break, uh, we will have uh, another discussion where we will uh, look into how to apply the guidelines to different types of education systems and contexts. And again, this uh, panel debate will be facilitated by uh, Professor Kay Livingston. And uh, you can see here from the slides all the participants uh, in the in the panel, which is uh, Hel Hislop from Ireland, Peter Lucas from the Netherlands. We have Susan Flockers from Etus and Rares uh, Volgu from Obesu. We also have uh, short interventions from Carmen uh, Martinez uh, from Spain and from uh, Jaroslav uh, Falzin from the Czech Republic. And, and excuse me if I do not pronounce your names correctly. I hope you can forgive me. Around five o'clock, we will uh, turn to a presentation from the European Commission by Ulrike uh, Pisiotis. And finally, uh, we will have Sofia Eriksson uh, Wasserskut to uh, do the concluding remarks. So this is a uh, quite a full program. So we better get started. So I will leave or handle over the mic now to Themis uh, Christofido uh, to to give us the welcoming address. Thank you very much and welcome. Thank you, and you're pronouncing my name very well. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for that. It's not easy. 
Good afternoon to all and a very warm welcome to our conference on policy design and implementation for key competence development in Europe. This event is a culmination of a year-long study carried out on behalf of the European Commission. The European Institute of Education and Social Policy ECORIS and the Danish Technological Institute have carried out here a very important task. They investigated policy reforms in member states for broad key competence development and a better achievement of basic skills and their findings resulted in a set of recommendations for member states that will be presented and discussed today. Now, key competences are not a new priority. In 2018, we put forward a Council recommendation on this very issue, which in turn served to update the 2006 Council recommendation on key competences. Key comp Competences have been a point of focus at EU level for almost two decades, actually. They are also a clear priority for our member states, with many introducing education since the first Council recommendation came out. And it is precisely this sustained focus that brings us here today. It is because of the last 20 years, bringing key competences to the fore, that we have the evidence and the wealth of practices that make this study so useful. Of course, we need to go further. So far, the EU has not met its target of fewer than 15% of 15-year-olds underachieving in reading, mathematics, and science. In fact, little progress has been made over the past In many cases, the pandemic has made things worse. COVID-19 put the spotlight on several shortcomings in our education systems that often led to learning loss. Children fell behind in developing and improving their basic skills. And the difficulties in connecting to each other during this pandemic certainly have made and still make that bringing them back to up to speed is a harder task. This was aggravated by lacking digital skills, of course, and infrastructure. The pandemic also increased the concern for the physical, mental, and emotional well being of children and young people. On the other hand, this highlighted how important it was to include personal, social, and learning the 2018 recommendation. It also showed how important it is to improve our collective performance in this arena. This kind of discussion forum on reforms is precisely what is needed to improve our guidance at EU level to implement and fine tune competence-based education and key competence development. Good policy design and implementation is by no means an easy task. And, I, and you know this, I'm not talking to people who are not experts here. Systems, traditions, structures are different in every country. On top of it, these are not immutable. They change over time. What might be right and justified at the beginning of a reform might become less effective or obsolete further along. In any case, reforms take time and change for the better is often not immediately visible. These realities require both commitment and flexibility. They also requ require us as a community to be able to step back and reflect, positively influencing the direction of our work. This is especially true as our competence needs are contingent on the challenges we face, and we're facing some very tricky ones currently. Some competences like basic skills have been around forever and they're not going anywhere reading, maths, basic understanding of science and technology. These remain essential. Technological innovation, digitalization, or the need to understand the natural world as we fight climate change guarantee that they will remain relevant. I already mentioned how personal and social competences, not to mention digital, have become so fundamental to cope with the pandemic restrictions. We can add the need for multilingual competences 
as well as cultural awareness and expression in the context of our increasingly globalized world. And of course, entrepreneurship and citizenship complete the eight key competences and are, and are essential to act effectively in society, in private enterprise, or even in our democracy. All these competences are a gateway to participation, to belonging in our community, and enriching the lives of those around us with our effort and our creativity. This is especially relevant this year as we're launching the European Year of Youth. We all want young people to be engaged and to participate. These competences are the means to do this. So, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, today we will look at this work, these five case studies, looking at different education systems, context, lessons. We will look at diverse reform paths, but we will be united by the same ambition, to learn from each other and to support better learning. It is this commitment that unites us. In fact, I cannot stress this enough. This whole exercise is an excellent example of peer learning among member states. We're learning from our different approaches and through our, our similar experiences also. Policymakers in, in other countries will now be able to use those recommendations to adapt their own strategies in line with their specific contexts. This is at the very core of our European approach to education. And it is at the core of our efforts to create a genuine European education area by 2025. After all, the area is both about sharing our expertise and insight with each other and about reinforcing our education systems so that young people can build their future wherever they may be. Across Europe, across borders and across cultures. So without further ado, I'm looking forward to your own insights. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much to uh, Themis and what I really miss here in these uh, online meetings is to be able to give you a big applause but thank you so much for uh, for sharing your thank thoughts. You. Thank you. Uh, moving on actually to the next agenda point, uh, we would like to introduce uh, Janet Looney and Magella Ushia who will now uh, give you a bit of an insight into the key findings of the study. So, so Christian, could you please uh, put up the slides again? And we welcome uh, Janet Looney and uh, Magella Ushia. Thank you, Karsten, and good afternoon, everybody. And let me add my welcome to you to our online conference here this afternoon. In this short session, uh, my colleague Janet Looney and I would like to provide you with a brief overview of our study on key competences in school education and on the policy recommendations and guidelines. The discussion following the presentation will be facilitated by Professor Kay Livingston, who is Professor of Educational Research Policy and Practice at the University of Glasgow. The study set out to establish how policy reform for broad competence development in school education, and particularly a better achievement of basic skills, can be effectively designed and implemented. It involved initially a phase of desk research, which included a mapping of the 27 EU member states to ascertain what key policies were introduced over the last 10 to 12 years around competence development um, and, better, and the better achievement of key skill, basic skills. We were interested in well-established policies rather than very recent ones so that we could learn from the approaches to implementation and see how that implementation was managed over time. The country mapping uh, then formed the basis of the analysis to allow us to select five state case study countries to explore the policies in more depth through a peer learning process. The outputs of the study are the draft recommendations and guidelines, which are on the conference webpage, and I've actually put a link to the guidelines in the chat in case anybody hasn't managed to access them so far. 
And there will also be a final study report, which will be published over the coming weeks. We're looking forward to your comments and suggestions today, as they will help us to shape these final two documents. Uh, just the next slide, slide please, Karsten. So um, our Director General has already talked to you uh, about key competences, and I know most of you here today are already very familiar with them. But just to remind ourselves that the competences are defined by the European Commission as a combination of knowledge, skills and attitudes. There are eight competences set out in the 2018 Council recommendation uh, in the areas of literacy, digital competence, citizenship competence, entrepreneurship and so on. It's important to note that these eight competences are considered of equal importance, but they may be applied in different ways and in different contexts and in different combinations, depending on the aims and priorities and approaches taken in different education systems. In addition, um, skills such as critical thinking and problem solving, teamwork, those transversal skills are also embedded throughout the key competences. And while basic skills are included in key competences, we have noted that some countries do treat them separately uh, to the development of the competences. So for this reason and for the purposes of the analysis, we looked at basic skills as being reading, mathematics and um, the, the science skills. We have certainly seen many um, different approaches in the country mapping examples uh, and in the five case study countries. Competence education is likely to represent a significant change in approaches to taken to teaching, learning and assessment and in ways of working within and indeed beyond schools. As a result, policies that are introduced to support competence education often involve complex change processes that are multi-layered, multifaceted and take time to implement. So I'll hand over to Janet now to talk about the key elements for effective change in policy design and, impl and implementation. Thanks very much, Janet. Great, thanks, Magella. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? Okay, so this slide lists some of the key elements for effective design and implementation of competence-based education. Um, as the Director General has emphasized already, um, competence is uh, very important. So for example, for several of our case study countries, uh, new competence-based initiatives were first introduced around the time of the, the 2008 financial crisis, and this had an important impact on the implementation process, particularly in regard to the availability of resources and teacher working conditions. Um, no matter where any country is in its process of implementing competence-based initiatives right now, they will be affected by the COVID crisis. Um, so that will be important to, to consider moving forward. Um, other country level contextual factors are also important. For example, whether competence based education represents a very radical shift in approaches to teaching, learning and assessment, whether it's one of just many reforms and there's a reform fatigue, um, if there are labor actions or other concerns. Um, no matter um, the, the different contexts, it's important for countries to learn from each other. Um, they can learn more about what they might anticipate in their own systems, ex expand their range of policy options, and better anticipate issues that may arise over time by comparing notes, so to speak. Um, the second and third elements on this slide, trust and effective communication, are closely related. Trust, of course, includes trust between national and regional or local levels uh, and institutions, as well as trust among colleagues in schools. Um, it's particularly important during change processes, um, but is also vulnerable to breakdown due to misunderstandings and miscommunications during the times of change and uncertainty. So it's, it's something to, to watch and support carefully. Um, importantly, trust can be built or rebuilt over time. So all is not lost if, if there's, there are issues regarding trust. In terms of communication, effective communication is essential to ensure the buy-in and trust of the key actors, including schools and teachers who are going to be implementing the reforms. In terms of countries' strategies to steer change and influence classroom practices, these vary across countries. They include choices regarding the mix of uh, what we refer to as hard and soft policy tools and the roles of actors at macro, meso, and micro levels, or in other words, national um, networks and school levels. 
So hard policy measures are those that are more rigorous and prescriptive. They include legislation, centrally organized implementation, and so on. Um, these are the, the um, policies that allow central governments to steer the direction of policy reforms, and they are aimed to sure, ensure equity and the same quality standards and provision across schools and, and regions. So these can be quite important um, and always are present at some level. Soft policy measures are more flexible and allow for adaptation at local levels. So they include frameworks, guidelines, school development focused on improvement, and so on. Um, they um, allow more flexibility at the local level and can be more effective in building trust and ensuring sustainability as more actors are involved in the policy design and implementation. Um, in deciding how to, to design the mix of hard and soft policy tools, countries need to consider where they are now. So for example, if they have a highly centralized approach, they can't move from, uh, from that to autonomy in one day. So there's a, a carefully a design strategy for change over time as needed. Um, evaluation, both formative and summative are important also. And we're mentioning, mentioning it specifically here because it uh, needs to be planned for in the early stages of policy design and it's frequently overlooked. Uh, formative evaluation, the ongoing type of evaluation can help capture unexpected results and help systems to make adjustments and the summative evaluation can capture impacts over time. Um, again, and that phrase over time is uh, also very important. This is our last point. Um, change of this scale takes a long time and countries may need to, to be very strategic in how they plan their changes um, and, and take into account that they may need to, to be building their implementation capacities over time and supporting teacher efficacy. Can I have the next slide, please? So this is a visual representation of a complex multi-layer education system um, and some of the important elements of implementation of competence-based approaches. So this cutout pie area at the top shows the multiple layers of education, starting from the European level and going down to the school level. Um, the text on the outside around um, is showing the um, the context and processes. So um, as mentioned earlier, political and economic context, such as a financial crisis can have a big impact. Um, and these all affect part of the process. Um, it is a, a cycle. Um, at the center of this diagram, you see the learner. And we've placed this deliberately here because competence-based approaches are constructivist and very learner-centered. Learners are actively engaged in the learning process. Um, learner voice is also important in terms of the policy design and implementation cycle, so um, learners can be included in this process, and that shouldn't be forgotten. Finally, the, the smaller pie pieces around the, the core um, are the elements that are um, important, or many of the elements that are essential for effective implementation. So governance, um, the commitment at the ministry level and the uh, stakeholders and their engagement, communication strategies, new curricula for uh, competence-based approaches, um, support for teachers to develop their competences to, to teach in new ways and to assess students in new ways, new ways of working within and across schools, new infrastructure and teaching materials. So as you can see, this is no small change um, in terms of competence development. All these elements need to be considered over time. Can I have the next slide, please? So this figure highlights the key dimensions of political commitment and implementation capacity. Um, political commitment includes the commitment of both ministry level and education stakeholders. So if you have the engagement of all those people, that's an important aspect. Um, strong implementation capacity includes a good understanding of the logic of new initiatives and a competent use of appropriate policy tools. Um, as you can see, um, there are different um, combinations of political commitment and strong implementation capacity. Ideally, everyone wants to be in the upper right-hand quadrant um, where implementation is most likely to happen. Um, and of course, countries have different strengths and weaknesses. I think both of the political commitment and the implementation capacity can be built over time. And uh, countries can be quite strategic in thinking about how to, to build those capacities, taking a stage-based approach. Okay, I'll hand it now to Magella. 
Thanks, Janet. Next slide, please, Karsten. So we thought we'd just give you a, a brief overview of the desk research, which was the first phase of the study. Um, as you can imagine, there was quite a lot of information and analysis gleaned from, from the desk research. Um, so in the short time that we have today, we can only really give you a little bit of an overview. The, max, the um, mapping exercise identified 79 reforms across the 27 uh, member states relevant to the development of key competences and basic, uh, and basic skills. If you can see the chart there, um, you, you'll notice that most of the reforms that met our selection criteria uh, focused on curriculum development. There were 51 of the reforms which are very much based around curriculum. These were followed by teacher building of teacher capacity, 40 reforms and uh, assessment practice, uh, 39 of the reforms. In many cases, curriculum and assessment reform was supported by work in developing areas such as teacher capacity and school leadership. So there is, of course, some overlap in these policy initiatives, reinforcing the complexity of change in policy and practice. It's rarely just one area that is covered, but a number of different uh, layers. Some countries also made some structural uh, changes to their education systems. For example, they might have made changes to the length of their school day in primary education, for example, or by increasing the length of time in compulsory schooling, in particular, lowering the compulsory school entry age and increasing the focus on early years education, often with the focus on addressing inclusion and the improvement of basic skills. Some countries addressed all or most of the key competences, the eight key competences in their reform efforts, but most focused on supporting particular competences or on a subset of them. So, for example, the most popular areas addressed were literacy, uh, 47 of the reforms addressed literacy, science, uh, technology, mathematics, there were 42, digital competences and multilingualism. Most of the reforms mapped seem to support all the basic skills together uh, rather than taking them individually. So the uh, science, reading and uh, mathematics. The next slide, please. When we looked at some of the common enablers uh, that came through the, um, the reforms across the 27, um, there was strong, the, the idea of strong political support was cited by a number of countries in the country mapping as being important for getting the reform up and running in the first place, but also ensuring that implementation is effective and sustained over time. In some cases, this political support referred to the commitment of ministers for education, while in others, it was a commitment of the broad group of stakeholders, or indeed, uh, sometimes a combination of both. School stakeholders, including school leaders, teachers, students and parents, especially need to be included from the design stage all the way through the implementation stages of policy reform, allowing for flexibility in the implementation approach in line with local and stakeholder needs. Not surprisingly, uh, professional development for teachers and school leaders and particularly building self-efficacy was highlighted as an important support for change as was financial support and investment in human resources, which might include time for teachers to lead aspects of the reforms, for example, or time for planning. As the country mapping exercise was conducted early in 2021, the move to remote schooling and the use of digital platforms and resources as a result of COVID-19 were already starting to have an impact on digital development. And in many cases, uh, there were the acceleration of developments and progress in this area uh, was noted uh, when we were doing the, uh, the uh, country mapping. Next slide, please. And of course, every country has had its challenges with the design and implementation of policies around key competences. And it has been a learning process for uh, all countries. And this is something that we were uh, privileged enough to be able to work through the uh, five case study countries in more depth with. When we look at the common challenges, we can see that those most cited are really the flip side of the enablers. So, in you know, where challenges uh, raised themselves, it was a lack of stakeholder engagement, little or no piloting, um, inadequate or poorly targeted co uh, communications. So you can see that enablers and challenges are often two sides of the same coin. 
and thought planning and resources are needed uh, to build the enablers and to address the challenges. Next slide, please. So we, uh, at the end of the, uh, the country mapping, uh, we came to a decision on the selection of five case study countries. Several key uh, considerations inform the selection um, of the, the case study countries for the in-depth uh, country research. It was important to the study team to select countries that are advanced in their reform efforts, that they can report on their experience and contribute to the lessons that can be learned. It was also important for the selected countries to provide access to a variety of experiences, approaches and systems, including countries that have approached their reforms in different areas or at different stages in sequencing steps of the reform in order to highlight diverse dimensions of the change processes. And we also looked for variety in the types of education systems and the governance structures of the five countries. Based on those criteria, the five countries selected were Denmark, Ireland, the Netherlands, Portugal and Slovakia. Next slide, please. So with those five case study countries, then we embarked on a peer learning group program. Um, we had four meetings of the peer learning group between May and October 2021. Um, and the cycle here followed the policy cycle of design and implementation of uh, policies through policy evaluation and adaptation and, um, and the development of, of policy recommendations. Alongside the peer learning uh, group meetings, we also conducted country workshops uh, with the assistance of country experts uh, in each of the five countries. And there were two uh, country workshops, one on the national policy analysis and, uh, and the views of stakeholders um, in each country. And one, the second one then was referred more to the challenges and successes of the uh, policy reforms and also focused on the situation re-COVID-19. Um, so while this followed the policy cycle, uh, this doesn't indicate that we see that, you know, as, as being a, it's something that's time bound. There was a lot of moving back and forward in the discussions uh, between the different areas uh, from meetings one through four. In the final meeting, participants were invited to reflect on questions or organised around the themes emerging from the first three meetings and from the, the country workshops and to consider the most important lessons learned regarding the role of political support, policy design and implementation of competence-based initiatives based on the experiences of each country. So um, that's a, an, an overview of the process, uh, a little bit about the desk recommendations, and Janet is going to uh, start us off talking, uh, looking at the recommendations and guidelines. Thanks, Janet. Thanks. Can I have the next slide, please? Okay, just as a sort of a, a segue, what I'll, I'll mention here is that our policy guidelines and recommendations are organized along the, the, um, pol the classic policy cycle. So just in the way that our peer learning group addressed um, the policy design and early implementation, then the deepening of policies and practices, evaluation and um, forward looking aspects. Um, we've also organized our uh, recommendations in that sense. Um, Reinforcing what Magella has just said, um, these are not to be taken as linear. We are not seeing um, a policy plan as being designed, put into place, evaluated, and that's it. Um, but um, it's a it's a, an effective way to to look at what happens across countries. Um, next slide, please. So beginning with the policy design and implementation process, um, these are just the headline areas. We have more detailed recommendations in the report itself, as you can see um, when you, you check that online. Um, first headline is the importance of engaging stakeholders in the design of policy, to, policy initiatives. So this is really increasingly part of the policy design process. Um, it hasn't been common up until very recently and countries are really exploring and learning how to, to make this work effectively. Um, they found that it, it does take more time, um, but that the time invested pays off over the longer term. And the research supports its effectiveness, um, finding that um, there's greater accountability, efficiency, and that, that it's a, a good governance model. 
Um, it's most effective when there's attention to building trust-based relationships, when it's transparent, um, when um, it builds capacity for clear and constructive debate, which is important because stakeholders themselves are not necessarily used to, to being engaged in this way. And having a structured process around a shared vision is also quite important. Um, the second headline, bring together aspirations and research evidence to develop a theory of change and clear logic for implementation. Um, so this is finding the balance between values and aspirations as, and uh, research evidence. The research evidence itself should, be, uh, should include academic, but also contextualized insights of school level stakeholders so that those are balanced. Uh, university partnerships can be productive in helping create that balance. Um, together, um, stakeholders can work to, to create a clear logic. Um, also, that logic needs to build on what's already there. What are the existing policies and practices? Because you're not going to go from, from one set to a totally different approach to teaching, learning, and assessment in one go. Um, piloting of new initiatives is important and it, it allows for an adjustment of plans. It provides the opportunity to gather early feedback on what's working well and to adjust, uh, refine, uh, refine any logistics of implementation and engage a broader group of stakeholders um, in the discussions on change processes. Again, effective communication channels are really important. These include both horizontal and vertical. So the horizontal is between the national or regional and the local levels, of course, and um, horizontal is across networks. So within schools and across schools. And this is an important part of the learning process for, for those who are implementing changes. And uh, reinforcing again, plans for evaluation need to be part of this process. Uh, next slide, please. So as implementation advances, there's a need to allow time for changes to take hold. And so we've thought of this as developing and deepening process, practice. Um, and we emphasize here the role of school leaders. So while school leader roles vary across countries, um, they all play a pivotal role in, in guiding school level change. And they need support to strengthen their own roles as leaders and facilitators of new approaches to teaching and learning. Um, Schools like uh, systems also need to introduce the changes over time. Um, then there's also a need to support teachers' professional learning communities. Uh, this includes policies to support opportunities for collaborative professional learning in schools as learning organizations and uh, to create conditions um, for change um, and learning across networks. So, Nigella. Okay, next slide, please. And the third strand or pillar of the recommendations is to do with evaluation and evaluating progress to support system and school level learning. And I think while we often associate evaluation with external processes, internal school evaluation focused on school development can also be very valuable. This evaluation will be most effective when, effective when a climate of trust and a focus on the quality of student learning and well-being is fostered. And the recommendations uh, focus on providing opportunities for school staff and stakeholders to develop competences, to gather and interpret data on the school environment and on student learning and well-being. Uh, supporting development of a shared understanding on the aims of competence-based initiatives and their evaluation within schools and between schools and external evaluator, uh, evaluators. You know, some schools will have a lower implementation capacity than others and may need extra support so that they have the resources and support needed to be able to work with data uh, and to be able to conduct these evaluations. And the school evaluation processes over time need to be dynamic and should themselves be evaluated and improved as needs be. In the second uh, recommendation about uh, feedback and feed forward loops, regular communication between national authorities and agencies and schools will ensure the challenges to implementation of competence based approaches are identified and addressed in a timely manner. Um, we found from the discussions in the peer learning group that there are numerous channels for feedback and feed forward, including, for example, professional development providers and teacher educators the inspectorate and curriculum developers and also universities and opportunities to engage with teachers and school leaders should be explored at all stages of design and implementation. What was what came through strongly in the peer learning group was the importance that feedback 
uh, from schools and to schools is coherent with the logic of the policy design and that adaptations and improvements made on the basis of the feedback are appropriate and also are visible, that people can see what they are recommending has been taken into account and makes a difference. And the next slide, please. So just very quickly looking at uh, building on the lessons learned and, uh, and looking forward. And I suppose our recent experiences of the disruption caused by COVID-19 has taught us of the important building on lessons learned, sometimes when those lessons are thrust on us unexpectedly. The COVID-19 crisis and emergency remote learning have revealed areas of fragility and resilience across systems, and in particular, the socioeconomic disparities between learners and their families have been made even more apparent. Um, in several countries, education systems have turned to teacher-based assessments, for example, for high-stake decisions such as graduation and university admission, as it wasn't possible to administer standardised examinations remotely. And I think this is an area that countries have found is something that they have to had to respond to uh, quite quickly. And it appears that there is quite a lot of learning to be had uh, from the, the responses that were made. And it is important to build on the lessons learned during the crisis. Um, some approaches that may help to capitalise on what has been learned would include the monitoring of the uh, impact of the crisis on implementation of competence-based initiatives and on student learning and well-being. And building on relationships, for example, with parents and carers who have played important roles in supporting their children's learning uh, from home uh, and supporting teachers to deepen assessment competences, including digital assessment competences. Just finally, uh, in terms of the policy learning approach that was used as part of the uh, study, uh, it, has been, it has proven, I think, to be a valuable policy learning process. Um, and these type of processes within and across countries can support reflection on past successes and ongoing challenges in policy design and implementation of competence-based initiatives. Opportunity for open engagement can help to open channels of communication and build trust across all key actors. Exchanging good practices within and across countries can support this type of policy learning and can encourage policymakers to reflect on lessons learned within their own context, but also on lessons that they might learn from other countries as well. Janet, just to finish this off there, I think. Okay. Uh, next slide, please. So this is just a big thank you for, for your attention. We really appreciate uh, your, your listening to, to our presentation. It's the product of a year's worth of work. Uh, we are now moving on to the more interactive stage of the discussion, and I'm going to hand it over to our facilitator, Professor Kay Livingston, and our discussant, Professor Edith Hora. So thanks. Thank you, Janet, and thank you also to um, Magella for their presentation. Um, I welcome Edith to join us for this uh, first part of the panel discussion. And also, I would like to give my welcome to all of you who are logged on and participants on this online conference. We're also looking forward to seeing your questions and comments come. So do keep putting them into the chat function. Well, welcome, Edith, and we're very interested to hear your thoughts on the recommendations that have been presented. Also, your insights on how education systems with diverse contexts, governance structures and different development needs could think about how they could perhaps tailor these recommendations for their own context and their own priorities. So over to you for, for a brief introduction. Thank you very much. Thank you for uh, inviting me uh, to participate in this session, in this conference, and to, to re uh, re reflect on the study on policy design and implementation, which is, I think, of great importance. And I think it's also very interesting that the approach has been taken uh, of peer learning. So the, the five case studies and uh, then learning from each other. Um, this is a difficult endeavor. Let me start with saying, good policies travel badly. And this is what I think everyone experiences. So it's very important um, if policymakers and uh, um, educational practitioners 
uh, want to tailor uh, policy design and policy ideas to their own situation, they have to learn um, and also to learn how to apply this to the specific historical, political, administrative and cultural, con cultural context. And maybe that is the hardest, hardest part and the, the biggest part. Um, I would like to reflect particularly on um, first the difficult uh, difficulty of implementation as such, then eliminate uh, some focal points which I consider as no regret. Uh, and then I would like to go into uh, the viewpoint of the implementers. Um, and what I, I, I will tell now, what I reflect on will also be much of underlining of the findings of the of the study which have just been presented. But let me let me first say that um, the hard work of turning policy into practice after the policy design and during the policy implementation, turning it into practice, there are no silver bullets. Um, and so we always have to be in search uh, of important and powerful contributors to better system performance. And this is what has been done in this study as well. Um, there are, are in the literature, but also in, in practice, there are different approaches on policy implementation. And the policy implementation of top down perspectives and policy on paper, we have left that a little bit behind. And uh, suppl supplemented it with new insights, new fruitful approaches. And I would like to highlight some of these approaches, which, which is first drawing on systems theory in order to be able to deal with the complex, multifaceted, multi-layered education systems most countries have. Uh, taking a network approach and doing that, focusing on the actors, state actors and non-state actors, which on the different levels of the system, and focusing on uh, how they engage in actions, in interactions and in relationships uh, with respect to, to, to the policy. Um, um, and well, I, I like to cite uh, Michael Barber with his ideas on deliverology. Um, he summarized these ideas in uh, policy implementation is a matter of gentle pressure, relentlessly applied. Well, then I, I go to my second point of my uh, re reflection. Uh, there has been years and years, decennia of research on policy implementation, also in other fields other than education. And the first thing, uh, the first main thing is change in policy implementation is change requires will, skill and capacity. This is a kind of general rule. And there are five focal points, uh, five no regret points which deserve attention. And the first is, it can't be said enough, um, generate a coherent and clear set of limited goals, limited goals, so less is more. Second, um, Avoid uh, multiple interventions, U-turns and policy borrowing. Policy borrowing in the sense of applying other policies, traveling badly, not being easily applied. Um, ensure that an implementation plan is informed by theory of action and that it is implicit in policy formation. Theory of action is a very important uh, perspective. Well, this has been said um, by, uh, by, by, uh, by the researchers, establish feedback loops at all levels in the system and all the time routinely monitor and address pro problems in order to, um, to address them and adapt and change your policy. And least but not last but not least, uh, indeed build professional skills and capacity at all levels to deliver the change and the improvement. Well, and my last point, my last reflection point is um, I would like to specify a little bit more on the notion of engaging stakeholders, which is indeed very important. It's important to engage them in the design, in the goals and the implementation of policy, education policies. Um, and I would like to focus on the viewpoint of teachers and 
school leaders and other educational professionals in practice. Um, because we all know we experience teachers and school leaders behavior during policy implementation do not necessarily align with policymakers ambition, not necessarily, sometimes not at all. Um, well, from their perspective, they are confronted with new policy programs, with change, with rules and regulations, and they have to implement it. Well, of course, the, 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 the idea um, of professionalization and professional learning as a condition for policy implementation is very important, but maybe this turns um, professionals a bit too much into objects, policy objects. So um, what we know from those years of research that uh, successful implementation is dependent, depending not only on the capacity, but also on the willingness of those who implement it. So the willingness of those school leaders, teachers and educational practice, practitioners. So I would like to introduce here in our discussion and our framework to, to look at these matters, the notion of policy alienation. Um, and this is about the extent to which the implementers, in our case, teachers, school leaders, identify with the policy. And this has also to do with the notion of trust, this concrete, make it more concrete notion of trust. Um, if they, the implementers, don't um, identify, they may be disconnected from the policy. And this disconnectedness is related to two two. Uh, things. First, uh, professionals, teachers may have a sense of powerlessness. And this is uh, caused by a lack of influence over shaping the policy and as it is introduced by government or in their own school organization. So sense of powerlessness. And the second is the sense of meaninglessness. If educational professionals, they don't perceive uh, added value from the from the policy from the change if they don't perceive added value for their own students for their own work or for uh, socially relevant goals which they consider relevant if they don't perceive that they sense meaninglessness mm -hmm. so this powerlessness and this meaninglessness um, well it is a risk and it's very important um, that um, uh, the implementers the practitioners the professionals do identify with the policy. Um, well, I, I conclude because I know we're going to be more interactive. I hope my reflections uh, provide some food for discussions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Edith. I, the it, really interesting points there in terms of policy alienation and the importance of the will and the sense of meaningfulness, not meaningless. So um, thank you for that. And I'm sure we will pick up some more. Um, you may have an opportunity to come back at the end and reflect on what our panel participants say, particularly perhaps around that building of trust and engaging with stakeholders. But thank you for now, and we hope to be able to come back to you uh, if time allows with the panel. Of course, thank you. So moving on, it's now an opportunity for me to welcome the panel who are going to offer their thoughts. Um, if I can briefly introduce them, first of all, we have three of our panelists who participated uh, in the peer learning groups and also in the country workshops. And we'll have the opportunity to hear from their experiences of key competence policy de design and implementation. I'm also very pleased to say that we have Michael Tush with us, who is head of unit at the European Commission, uh, uh, DG for Education, Youth, Sport and Culture. So perhaps I'll, I'll turn to, to Michael first in terms of thinking about the importance of peer learning before we have an opportunity to hear from the panelists about their experiences in peer learning. Um, the European Commission plays an important role in facilitating peer learning opportunities. Can, can I ask you, Michael, to comment on the importance of international policy learning among the, the member states in terms of how also the European Commission supports the countries to adapt their policies to their own context and priorities. 
Yeah, thank you very much, Kay, and uh, for the welcome and uh, good afternoon to all of you. And thanks you so much to, to participating here in the conference, but also in the study, the researchers, but also the countries who have um, participated in the study. That's great because it was really a peer learning study. And um, of course, I, you know, this exchange is, is bread and butter for us. It is why I get a salary. And because we try to support countries who are responsible for education and training to learn from each other. So of course, what Edith Hoge just said, um, good policies uh, travel badly made me think. <laughs> so because it shows she rightly so um, um, highlighted the, uh, the difficulties that you cannot just copy paste in a way a policy that has worked in a particular country to another one. Uh, I think that's the way what the message I got it. You have to look at, uh, at specific national, regional contexts, cultures, actors, their interests there, of course. Uh, my experience, however, is that uh, this being said, uh, we have a number of questions that uh, all member states of the European Union, even beyond, uh, are really struggling with. And so they all have issues of, of, of an insufficient number of, of, of learners not having the basic skills and the key competence acquired in, the, in a way that they cannot actually participate in the society or work properly. So this is something which, is, which concerns quite an important number of countries. We see that this very often has a socio-economic background as strongly impacting on this. And some countries have similar issues, but some are doing better and some are doing having big challenges. So that's why the countries themselves have decided to, there's a number of issues that we would like to look at what others are doing. And uh, let's say just coming from the council this morning and uh, France currently has the presidency of the European Union, and France, like any other country I could mention, and Denmark, Ireland, Slovakia, the countries we have here, is very proud of their own system and what they have achieved. But still they say, we know we're good, but we have big challenges elsewhere. We're very curious to look at what the others are doing, and we think we can learn from that. And that's basically uh, why, why, why I think my job is still useful, why I'm so happy that we're discussing here. And that's why I think this study is useful, because then I will turn to the study. You may, you may know... It's been said that this, the key competencies, we have had it for quite a while. I mean, this policy, I mean, the first recommendation is already 2018 was a revision of an earlier recommendation done 15 years earlier, 10 years earlier. Um, and I mean, it showed the way, the reason why we did the revision was exactly that, that we had a sort of commitment to promote key competences, but it wasn't so easy to do. So we did a bit of an update on the definition of the competence, but the big message was, hey, in order to make it work, we have to look at uh, learning approaches. We have to look at teacher education and training. We have to look at, at uh, how assessment is done. So we, the, the, the countries and, and, and we from the commission after doing this uh, evaluations have said, this is what we should look at. What does it take to make it work because what can happen because we have a community out there who's interested in making it work. That's why I'm also happy we have this study here to say, uh, and then I'll stop in a moment, <laughs> we'll come back at it later. It's this, this aspect which has been mentioned a lot about communication exchange involving the actors. Because I mean, it's also, we talk implementation, also Edith Hogus just said, it's not a top down, it's more a learning process. And this is something which comes again strongly out of the, uh, the, the message and then come to, to come back to your uh, original question. That's why I think European cooperation in, ex in the peer learning exchanges we do or with Erasmus project is so useful. Yeah. Thank you, Kay. Thank you, thank you, Michael. And I think the, the emphasis on the multiple layers and so many things that have to be considered in policy reform and how over time we can learn from one another in terms of the different changes that are made. So thank you. It was it was uh, very helpful to have that introduction and then have the opportunity to hear from the other panelists in terms of their involvement in the peer learning group uh, from a European perspective. So, so thank you very much, Michael. And can I turn now to introducing the, the panelists? We're going to hear from Elspeth Aller, who's Head of International Affairs for Children and Education from the Ministry of Education and Children in Denmark. Uh, we don't have Dr. Drastislava Kikosova from the state, who is a state advisor at the Department of Curriculum and Innovation in Education for the Ministry of Education, Science, Research and Sport. 
in the Slovak public. But she is going to, um, we are going to hear from her from a, through a recorded message. We also will hear from Maria Emil Emilia Bredora Santos, who is the president of the National Council Education Council in Portugal. And first of all, I'm going to turn to Elspeth to hear about the experiences from the perspective of Denmark. Denmark, as you have heard, was one of our case study countries. And also uh, Elspeth was involved in the peer learning group and had the opportunity to work with others in discussing the policy implementation, policy design stage, the implementation and also the evaluation. So Elspeth, from your involvement in the key competence uh, policy design and implementation, what have you found that, that worked well? What might others be able to learn from the Danish context? Well, first of all, thank you, uh, and thank you for the the time in the peer learning uh, group. I must say that for me, uh, it underlined that yes, as education systems, we are very, very different, but probably because we are in European context, we are also similar in some ways, both approach, our thoughts and our school systems. So there is something to learn, but because of these similarities, I found that it's easier to concentrate on the differences. We don't have to start uh, all uh, from the beginning of introducing how do our school systems work and which values and purposes. Uh, so thank you for that. It has been very, very, very interesting. Now to answer your question, um, and here I feel like I'm repeating what everyone else has said. Involving stakeholders, which Edith also emphasized and, and, uh, and the presentation of Janet and Nigella as well, uh, to me and to us is crucial in the implementation of reforms. Uh, and it is to, to me one of the key recommendations in the report. Stakeholder involvement is crucial um, so that the strengths and weaknesses and also the real needs of the sector are taken into account and ideally also reflected in the reform. Because we may, in our ivory tower, believe that we know what the needs are, but in, in uh, the dialogue and involvement of the stakeholders, we will really learn. And it also, we find, provides the best chances of broad acceptance and an understanding of the need of the reform, as was just mentioned, that without the, the, the purpose being part of uh, the stakeholders work, as it, it doesn't really make sense. If you don't see that there is a, a need for this and a, a real proper purpose, then it won't work. And just to, to uh, mention a thing that Magella mentioned as well on COVID, that there is a lot of learning to be, to be uh, taken from, from dealing with COVID. That is our experience as well, because uh, in dealing with the pandemic, uh, we have involved the stakeholders very, very closely, so back, all, all the way from the begin beginning of the pandemic, and it's still the case. We work very closely with and very regularly with all key stakeholders, students, parents, school leaders, teachers, etc., at different levels. And this, this cooperation and partnership has now developed into a formalized partnership that we call Samen um Schulen. And as I'm sure most of you won't understand, it uh, roughly it translates into together for the school. And um, well, I, I must say that the experiences with that partnership already now are very, very positive. So we recommend, as the report does, that countries beginning a reform process involve stakeholders as early and as much possible to create shared, uh, a shared sense of uh, mission, trust and ownership. And I don't know if I've got time, but I'd like to mention just uh, an example on how this partnership 
that I just mentioned has been used already. Yeah, yes. you're nodding, so I believe this time. Um, a political uh, agreement was reached in Denmark in October 2021 uh, about a future evaluation and assessment system in primary and lower secondary school. And that was the in this partnership, so in close cooperation with it. And uh, as this now is uh, turning into legislation, the partnership comments on the law bill in uh, on the way. So there is a very, very close cooperation also on what will be included in the law. Now, uh, anything else? It's, it's, it's very interesting, Elspeth, that the, the, the sense of building that partnership at the early phase of policy design, rather than bringing the stakeholders into the process much later on. And I see a comment uh, in the, the chat in relation to the sense of how, from a practical perspective, policy ideas are transferred or understood in, uh, into ideas within the actual classroom. And again, being able to bring stakeholders in at that early phase to be able to explore what does this policy actually mean from a classroom perspective. It sounds as if the partnership you're suggesting would be extremely helpful. True, and, and actually this is an example of the way that the, our, the, the Danish Ministry of Children and Education uh, works and wants to continue to work. Um, and another little point which I think uh, is important to, to mention is that we, in the, the real long process of uh, our reform, so implementing it, uh, we experienced the need for changing direction during the implementation process. So you need to course correct mm -hmm. on the way. And as part of that, continue to learn from the development and experiences when the implementation is actually taking place. So on the way, so you learn from what's happening and there must be a flexibility to then course correct accordingly. Yeah, and, and I, I wonder if our experiences with having to be very flexible within this COVID pandemic will help us in that sense of changing direction. Yeah. So thank you very much, Elspeth. At this point, we we are we are sorry it's such a brief time that we have to to talk with one another, but um, we have an opportunity now to hear the recorded message from Dratislava from uh, Slovakia. Uh, if Carsten, you can put it on for us, uh, it's a very short message from her, but we're really pleased to have the opportunity to hear from her. In 2008, Slovakia adopted the new Education Act, which brought two level educational programs, state and school, and competencies as a goal of education, in addition to knowledge. Before that, the education was based on the transfer of knowledge, and the state prescribed when, what, and to what extent will be taught. Now, the state determines the compulsory minimum in the state educational program, and the school has the freedom to profile itself in its school educational program. It has opened up the possibility for schools to focus their education on competencies. NGOs, corporate foundations, and some university have done a very good job here, giving space to innovative teachers and creating programs in which schools can get involved. The numbers of schools where changes are really starting to take place through such initiatives are increasing. We have understood how communication and involvement of all stakeholders is crucially important to build the trust and engage them for the change. We work on it through different channels now conferences, working groups, social media, and so on. Another way we try to support teachers to make the change in their teaching is to offer them enough teaching materials, like textbooks, digital educational content, 
worksheets and so on, mentoring and networking them. We are building a network of regional centers of curricular management and support for schools. We need to work more on the evaluation process and feedback loops, set the indicators to see and follow the positive changes in the system. We set the goals according to the results from OECD testing. The main one would be to improve pupils' learning outcomes in basic literacy about the OECD average. An important shift may bring change to the assessment from distinguishing tests to criteria-based tests. Thank you. And we extend our thanks to Dratislava. We're sorry that you weren't able to be at the conference online today, but thank you for, for that message and, and reminding us of that change that Edith talked about from hopefully saying goodbye to more of the top-down hierarchical type of policy making to greater involvement of, of stakeholders and that emphasis on schools having more freedom to be able to make decisions about their, their policy. These are recommendations that we heard from Janet and from Magella and also from Edith. So now is our opportunity to turn to Maria Emilia. We welcome you Hello. to the panel. And as Michael was saying, key competence policy has been around for some time. And I know in Portugal it's evolved over time. So we're very interested to hear your insights into the sense of policy design implementation. And particularly, I know that you have something to say around the evaluation of the policy. So uh, we look forward to hearing your views, Maria Amelia. Thank you very much. and. Thank you all very much for inviting me to be here and to be part of the group. Um, I think this is uh, a very important uh, group and a very important initiative. Uh, I have followed for many years different attempts at change, different innovations, some more top down, some more bottom up. Um, and uh, or are some mixed. Uh, but in, in every case, I was very impressed by its frailty and how difficult it is to really change and to make the change last. So, the, so I think it's uh, uh, very good to have this uh, group for two reasons. First, because we learn with each other. Second, because um, international commitments have shown that they are important for us to keep the focus. For example, in 2010, we agreed with the European Union to attain a certain num number of targets in education. Um, and it has been uh, the role of uh, this uh, uh, National Council of Education to every year publish a sort of a snapshot of the system and verify if those targets are being uh, approximated or not. Okay, so um, I think that is uh, that's very good that you we can do this work together. Um, uh, the the importance of um, Meso structures, you know, we were talking about the importance of not being just top down, but still to have some focus that remains, a political context, the importance of being um, bottom up, so that um, in, in there, um, it, they can, uh, teachers and all partners can feel not alienated as Edith was uh, talking about um, and how it it um, it, it, it can uh, it it is more uh, sure to be fit for the situation but also and I have found this particularly true with the COVID uh, now the, the the closing of schools and how um, the system reacted very quickly with digital education and so on, but still people were not prepared. 
and how important it was to have these networks of teachers helping each other and how trustworthy they were felt to be. So that's another another point I would like to make. Um, also, in the pro in the evaluation of uh, you talked about my interest in the evaluation of this um, reform, um, which is not an evaluation not an evaluation of the reform, but indirectly it gets uh, to be. Um, I just uh, will just say comment, make two comments. One that those targets that we were commit that we committed ourselves to attain by 2020, most of them we really did. And uh, I must confess I was surprised because I thought with COVID that would not happen. But the truth mm -hmm. is, or uh, the all the, the indicators of school failure, of dropouts, of um, entering universe, higher education, they were all uh, or attained or almost all attained or, or almost there. I, I want to be very careful and um, and we want to keep an eye on it as it were, because maybe the impact was not in 2020 and it will be in 2021 or 2022. But still, it's amazing that this was possible. And although this is not, it was not intended to be um, an evaluation of this reform, still indirectly it is sort of an evaluation of this reform. Another indirect uh, evaluation um, came from a, um, a, a, a consumers association that ha has had done in, nine, in 2016 a, an international questionnaire uh, to the Portuguese population asking about the most trustworthy institutions. And at, in 2016, the educational public system was considered quite good, but it was fifth or sixth position. In 2021, in March, April, when they did the new, um, the new survey, it was the first, it was the most uh, trusted institution of all the Portuguese institutions, which includes uh, political institutions, or the army, the police, the, the, the church, all of them, all of them, uh, many of them. Anyway, so this was also an, a, an, an interesting indication that uh, I thought that they were able to build a trust among the community. So, um, still, I, I, in, in my former practice, um, I used to, to say that adversaries are the best friends of um, decision makers and of researchers. And I wish we could look into that too. I mean, I wish we could know what, um, because I've seen so often we have a very nice reform and a very, and then uh, the climate changes, the political climate or the economics change, and there it goes with the, the child with the bathwater. So uh, I, I would be interested in knowing what are the main criticisms that are being uh, uh, it's, being it's said. A, it's an interesting <laughs> point from the point of view that we hear about the enablers um, Janet and Magella was talking about the enablers, but I know in the peer learning group, it also gave everybody an opportunity to hear from things that perhaps didn't go quite so well. So yeah. thank you very much for, for raising that point that we must also learn from each other, not only in terms of the enablers, but those things that perhaps cause barriers for us in our policy uh, design or our policy implementation. So if I can very quickly turn back to, to Edith and then perhaps to, to Michael in terms of any reflections on, on what you've heard, Edith first. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, well, very interesting to, hear, to hear, to learn the other reflections of the of the other participants in this uh, session. And I'm taking away two, two things. Um, indeed, <laughs> um, 
it is very important not only to stress the differences, but to share the questions and challenges that are similar. Uh, uh, despite the differences in culture, history, administrative context, etc., etc., uh, education system, of course, um, there are general uh, questions and challenges. And um, what I well to say that again, what I found interesting in that, as I, I as I, I see in this project, the emphasis is put on learning on how to tailor. Um, answers to those questions and challenges, how to tailor them to the, to the specific country situation. And that is the right thing to do, because the, as I started, <laughs> that's the hard, hard work. So, yeah, I um, and the second uh, what, uh, thing what came in mind is maybe uh, a, a, a short thing. I, I, I learned that uh, Maria Emilia is president of the Edu National Council of Education in Portugal. Um, I'm, I'm chairing the Education Council in the Netherlands. I know many countries do have a, a National Council of Education. And I think, or maybe I hope, that these councils uh, can be of help in these processes we're talking about. Because especially these councils, they are um, depoliticized. Mm -hmm. And they can take a more independent, long-term, but also his historic look at policy building, policy design, uh, education issues, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, that and the, the last thing I wanted to say uh, related to this political aspect, uh, I found it very interesting to learn from the, the study, the findings that political commitment, political support in, in the qua quadrant is very important to, uh, to implementation and success. And of course, that's very understandable. Mm -hmm. But maybe we should stress also the tension that the political support and commitment can fade away mm. in cycles of four year or less years uh, government. Yeah. For example, we just have a new government here in the Netherlands and we're also looking forward to the new policy ambitions. But this can mean indeed policy uh, uh, abolition, abolition. Yeah. So um, it might be an interesting uh, avenue to think about if some change and policy should be to be sustainable, should be depoliticized, mm -hmm. should be put in another space in society, maybe at an education council or at, at, in the in the education field, and a bit shielded from political turbulence. Well, this also depends on the country. Thank, thank you, Edith, and and I think that um, Maria Emilia made an important point in relation to the international um, engagement between member states also helped Portugal in terms of being able to keep the focus on certain policy commitments. So I think that's an interesting, um, those two interesting ideas in terms of depoliticizing, but at the same time, how international cooperation can also keep the focus on particular policy commitments. So, Michael, if I can just turn to you for, for the last word before we we can take some questions, perhaps from the, the participants that are, are logged on online. Uh, thank you, and thanks a lot to Maria Emilia again and, uh, and the others. Uh, it's uh, the Danish example from Elizabeth. It's just, uh, the, I was thinking this, the effects of the COVID crisis that some of you have um, uh, talked about. Um, because uh, I very much liked it. I don't know um, who of you now said, I think it was Elspeth from Ella from, from Denmark, how you've worked with the uh, stakeholders during this um, uh, period. And uh, that is actually something hopefully positive to come out of it. And uh, that there's, this is a big challenge, which I think confirms how important this work of key competence is, because what we've seen in the crisis, I mean, my reading, I mean, you correct me, is that I mean, we've seen many challenges um, in terms of continuation, but also we see what are the challenges. I and mean, we've really seen a strong focus on the social impact, I mean, the socioeconomic background impacting on outcomes, but also how this is related to the capacity to organize self-directed learning, which has become so important because really shown, I mean, we've seen some big uh, divided situations between those people who were able to go well through the crisis or what we've seen the last two years, because we were able together with the support of their teachers and the teachers who had the competences 
to, to work with their pupils, but to, to provide them not knowledge, but actually are you able to resist the challenge, organize your learning, even if the conditions change? And I think mm -hmm. those there we have a group of people who are able to, to master the key competences. I mean, basic skills, science, mathematics, mm -hmm. reading, but also learning to learn, citizenship issues. I mean, those are those who have been able to go through the, the crisis uh, relatively well. I mean, we all suffered, but I mean, relatively well. And those teachers were able to implement these key competence approaches. Mm -hmm. And this is why I think we've just, uh, we had proposed last autumn, um, uh, just in, in summer uh, from the commission and the council adopted in November a recommendation on blended learning, which which looks indeed, I mean, can you can we mix different forms of learning uh, everybody uh, thinks of digital, but it's broader. It can be outdoor learning. It can be go to museums. I mean, how can we make learning more attractive and for more meaningful by engaging into um, and in different types of learning? And this is something which makes, which is very much in line with the key competences. And very similar, just last Friday, we adopted a proposal uh, on the other big, big, big issue. It's on learning for environmental sustainability, climate change. Everybody what is told, being told to us, if you want to integrate this into education, is also very much about uh, helping people to, to understand very complex challenges uh, and in order to, 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 to cope with, with the uncertain situation, with a very sound knowledge base, and, but also competences for further learning. So I just want to say how important this competence-based approach is on the challenges of today, on dealing with COVID, on climate change, making the digital transitions meaningful. That's yeah, I, I, I think I it's, it, it's almost as if the, the COVID-19 pandemic actually brought the, the importance of the key competences much more to the forefront mm -hmm. because we had to rely so heavily, as you say, on things like self-directed learning, being much more aware of the, the kinds of challenges that are faced within society around engagement and being able to have access to technology and, and climate change. So lots of these things came to the forefront in many ways. Um, so thank you for that. And, and also before we, we close this panel, can I turn to Carson just to see if there are any particular questions that you want to draw attention to? Yes, thank you. We we have a few questions actually uh, in the chats, and 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 one here from from Julian Stanley, uh, who who asked. It seems to me that pretty much of all of the findings and recommendations relate to any policy development and implementation in education. I wonder if there's any special about policy for key competences. I think that's the, that's an interesting uh, question both for the for the panelists, but perhaps also for for Magella and and Janet. Mm -hmm. Any comments that we want to, to make from the panel? Would any of you like to respond? Janet? Um, yeah, I would. I, I think that's an excellent question um, and uh, something that does need to be brought out. Um, I, I want to answer that on two levels because there was also a question about whether there were any studies that address adult learning or lifelong learning that are similar to this. I, I'm not aware of any. Um, but I, I would also say that those would take a different angle, um, that they would be different approaches because they're placed in the system very differently. So first of all, we're at a school level. Um, second, um, I want to, I would emphasize um, the complexity of change that moving to a competence-based approach is a sea change in an education that can't really be underemphasized. So um, Jeff Mulgan, for example, who's a specialist in social innovation, um, differentiates between fairly straightforward top-down policies that are easy to implement and complex changes that require more engagement, more that are more effective when there's more uh, autonomy of key players on the ground. Getting to that point is um, something that's much more challenging. Um, and involves more thinking. And then just finally, um, competence-based education touches at the heart of, of so many aspects of education that um, it's it's all-encompassing. So that can't be underemphasized. Thank you, Janet. And Edith, I think you had your hand up. Yes, yeah, because I, I also love this question and it's very to the point. I would say, um, yes, it matters a lot that it is policy implementation on education, especially uh, key competences, because it taps directly into the education learning processes in the classroom. It taps into the work of professionals, teachers. And um, 
that matters. So there is content um, and also because education is a thoroughly social uh, process. So all these features should be taken into account in uh, dealing with the policy. Mm. That, and it would be different from other content. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Edith. And just to draw everybody's attention, uh, Michael Took has put into the, the chat the, the link to the blended learning document that he mentioned. And also I should draw attention to Ulrika Pesotis, also from the European Commission, who you will hear from later, has put a link in on the, the learning environment for sustainability as well. So uh, do look at those documents and the links are there for you. Carson, any more before we, we close our panel? I think we have time for just one more question, and and one came here from Andreas Rush uh, Christensen, who also was uh, part of of the, the the core team around this uh, this study, and he he asked, uh, curriculum development and design is important to support and guide good teaching, but in many countries there has been a too narrow focus on how to evaluate curriculum and students uh, teaching. How do we support not only competence based curriculum, uh, but also purpose based curriculum? Interesting distinction. Again, any panelists that would like to pick up on that? Well, I mean, I could at least say that I've seen, it depends very much on how the curriculum is designed. I mean, I've seen the issues that have just been mentioned that they are included in the curricula of some countries. I mean, you have curricula of countries who do not only say this is sort of the knowledge uh, I would like to achieve, but I mean, you, I, I know curricula from countries or from regional authorities uh, who are much broader, of course, they also include the issues that have just been been mentioned. Uh, so I don't see the contradiction between the purpose based and the curriculum necessarily it depends on the quality of the curriculum, of course. That's my observation, at least. Fred May. Mm. Um, there are some situations that are really also almost impossible to overcome as, as if you m keep them as they are. For example, in Portugal, the, the um, access to higher education is dependent on the exams of secondary school. So the pressure to have um, for secondary schools to be just uh, preparing for higher education and and to be centered on content because those exams are very much centered on content it almost uh, becomes a, a, too much of a pressure so to speak on this sort of big change that that we want to have so uh, it really s was good to show how that's a point we must change. We must separate uh, secondary education and the exams for higher education, or else we can't change uh, secondary education into a more competence-based one. Thank you very much. And I'm afraid we just uh, lost our facilitator K for uh, mm -hmm. a, a short while. But uh, looking at the time, I can see that we are close to a comfort break now. So so I would like to take the opportunity to say thank you very much to all the panelists for uh, for joining the discussion. Thank you so much. Much appreciated for your contributions. It, just before we go to uh, well-deserved uh, comfort break, uh, I would like to uh, invite you to participate in a very short Mentimeter poll. And uh, Christian, if we could have uh, the slides up again, please. Um, we have prepared just four questions uh, for a short Mentimeter uh, poll, and you can uh, you can enter uh, menti.com and use the code you can uh, see here on the slide. And, and the four uh, questions that we would like you to reflect upon is uh, what is the biggest challenge in your country related to effective stakeholder engagement, school level change? monitoring and evaluation and student assessment. So this uh, Mentimeter uh, survey or poll will be open uh, for the next uh, 10 minutes, then we'll close it down. And because we need just five minutes to uh, to collect the results uh, so we can show it after the break. 
So uh, for now, I suggest that we uh, we go to a 15 minutes uh, comf uh, comfort break. So back here again at uh, 10 minutes to four. Enjoy the break and uh, see you back soon.
Okay, welcome back. We are slowly getting uh, started again. And I hope you had time for some fresh air and uh, maybe a cup of coffee during the short break, even though you had to reply on the poll also. <laughs> but thank you very much for, for all of you who, who, who did reply uh, to the Mentimeter. Just before I, I hand over the floor again to Kay, I just wanted to, to show you uh, the results of the Mentimeter uh, poll. So, so Christian, um, perhaps you could uh, share the results with us. And and we, we also got a comment in the in the chat that uh, that's we forced you to to select only one one answer uh, through through each of the the four themes, and uh, we apologize for that. But sometimes we need simplicity to uh, <laughs> to be able to explain anything. So you can uh, you can uh, put on the next slide, please, Christian. So what is the biggest challenge in your country related to effective stakeholder engagement? And as you can see here from the bars, 40% of you replied need for a better communication strategy. And this was closely uh, followed by uh, no shared view on priorities for student learning. And then we had a third one here on the very left, no tradition of stakeholder engagement. So quite a, a, a clear picture. Next slide, please. What is the biggest challenge in your country related to school level change? Uh, and here we can see that the responses were, were almost equally divided between uh, four uh, choices. Uh, in the very far left of the chart here, uh, lack of teacher buy-in uh, to new approaches. Then the with 26 is 26 percent of the responses, lack of free. Uh, oh, sorry, I need my glasses on here. So uh, lack of time for teacher uh, professional development and also with 26% need to build trust with teachers. And finally, uh, uh, policymakers uh, have not engaged with school leaders and teachers during implementation. So equal distribution almost. Next slide, please. What is the biggest challenge in your country related to monitoring and evaluation? Again, almost equal between no specific plan for monitoring evaluation at national level or and need for school uh, schools to develop evaluation capacity. Also with 25% need for formative and sum uh, summative evaluation, it was also uh, selected uh, by a few uh, respondents. And the final slide, please. What is the biggest chance in your country related to student assessments? And here the winner was lack of alignment of tests and competence based curricula. So that's it. Very quick poll. Thank you very much for participating. And with that, I will hand over the floor again to Kay and perhaps also some reflections on the on the results from the Mentimeter. Thank you, Karsten, and welcome back to everybody. I hope you had a, a pleasant uh, break. Um, just to, to draw attention to some of those responses in the, the Mentimeter, and um, thank you to Glenn for drawing our attention, as Carson said, to the fact that we forced people to, to provide one answer when perhaps some of you wanted to reply to, to more than one answer. Um, it is a, an opportunity for you to engage and for us to get a feel for uh, the participants across the whole conference. So it's only a snapshot and we take it in those um, in that perspective. Very interesting about the biggest challenge for stakeholder engagement is uh, the better communication strategy. And um, I'm certainly going to ask the panelists in the, the next panel in relation to perhaps um, some of the learning that they've got and some of the experience they've got in developing a communication strategy. It was certainly one of the things that, that took up a lot of discussion in the peer learning groups, so we will return to that. At school level, the, the lack of teacher buy-in and also time for teacher professional learning. Um, I think in terms of the lack of teacher buy-in, both what we heard from Edith and from Elspeth and uh, Maria Amelia in terms of that sense of, of the willingness, um, but the willingness only comes from understanding that something is purposeful, meaningful, 
uh, in terms of, of how those uh, policy initiatives can be translated into to classroom practice. So again, it tells us that sense of engagement of stakeholders as early as possible and time for teacher professional learning. Again, it's it's the time that is actually needed to be able to consider how the policy um, implementation impacts on what they do in a day to day basis and not only what it means in the context of a country or a region, but what does it mean in the context of a school and a particular classroom with a particular group of, of students? And that takes time and every teacher is an individual and some will require more professional learning than others. And so it, it really takes professional learning, not only at perhaps a national or regional level, but also in relation to professional learning in relation to my own students. And how do I translate this into what I do in my classroom, in my own curriculum area and the context of the community? I think uh, evaluation, again, really interesting to see the responses there in terms of no specific plan for evaluation at, at national level and uh, during the project we had an input from Beatrice Pont from OECD and she talked about the importance of evaluation and again the sense of when it should occur and how that evaluation should actually take place and so again this was something that we considered and I will ask the, the panellists the uh, question about the evaluation that, that they've experienced and Janet talked about both formative assessment and summative assessment. And then it, moving from the national to the school in terms of the need for schools to develop their own educational policy and also their own capacity and ability to and time to engage in um, carrying out an evaluation of what's going on in relation to uh, key competence policy initiatives. So. Um, Thank you for that. And, and we are fortunate that we have a, a student, uh, a, a stakeholder, a student organisation joining us in the next panel. And I think being able to to talk about the, the lack of alignment in relation to um, the testing that still is, is often a preferred form of ass assessment compared to how do we go about assessing key competences It'll be very interesting to hear the, um, the opinions from our panellists on that matter. So thank you for your input and uh, accepting the limitations that have been pointed out. It has given us a sense of, of some of the, the key priorities. Um, so we move to the, the second panel. Again, it is my pleasure to have the opportunity to um, welcome the panellists and also to uh, introduce them. Um, <coughs> I shall just find the, the right page that I've got my list of panellists on here. Uh, so the focus of this particular panel is on thinking more about applying the guidelines and the recommendations that we heard from both Janet and Magella to different types of education systems and contexts. And in this panel, we'll hear, first of all, from two panellists who again were directly involved in the peer learning groups. Uh, from Ireland, we have Harold Hislop, who is Chief Inspector in Ireland, and we have Peter Lucas, who is a policy advisor at Bio Road Rad in the Netherlands. We we'll also hear from two countries who were not involved directly in the peer learning groups, but of course have had experience in relation to implementing um, key, key uh, competence policy. Carmen Cabrello Martinez, who is head of area of general regime education, general subdirectorate for academic organization, director general for evaluation and territorial cooperation from the Ministry of Education and Vocational <coughs> Training in Spain, and also from Yaroslav Falton, who is EU Department Deputy Director. Minister of Education, Youth and Sport and from the, the Czech Republic. And we will also hear, as I said, the student perspective from Reis Voisu, uh, apologies if I'm not pronouncing your name correctly, who is from Obesu and um, offering perspectives from a teacher stakeholder organisation. We have Susan Glocken, uh, who is the European Director of ETUSH. 
So welcome to you all, and I look forward to hearing about the perspectives from you. First of all, I'm going to turn to you, Harold, if uh, you're connected. Can you just say hello if you can hear me? Yes, Kay, yes. I, hope, I hope that's fine. Thank you. No, no problem. So Harold, um, from a perspective of Ireland, uh, based on your involvement in the peer learning group and in this project, and also the experience you've got in relation to, to policy design and implementation, how, um, what are your mm -hmm. thoughts about applying the recommendations and perhaps thinking particularly about what we've heard in the Mentimeter, engaging with stakeholders and maintaining and, and building trust in policy uh, implementation? Thanks, Kay. And, and uh, it's great to be here, uh, particularly seeing the, the results of the outcome of a year's work, which is really, really, I think is going to be a really, really valuable study. Um, because mm -hmm. I, I think it's what it's, uh, as a participant, if I can start there, it has really enabled reflection, not only between countries, but also even within countries. I mean, I've noticed that this, the, the, the people who have been involved in Ireland in the case studies have themselves started a conversation within, uh, among themselves. So that's really, really been useful. And actually, sometimes um, having this conversation prompted by somebody outside actually helped us to have a conversation internally um, maybe about issues that we had found too controversial even to discuss and reflect on fully ourselves you know so it it came at just the right time for us and i suppose that's what i i was reflecting on what lessons can we take from this for the next phase of curricular reform and i suppose in the irish context the most pressing one of that is at the upper secondary level where we're where we're embarking on a on a pretty major piece of curriculum and assessment reform and to some extent at primary education as well i mean one of the things that i think the strongest thing that comes from me is the importance of the trust the relationships and the genuine stakeholder engagement and i mean it's I mean, it's very clear to us we need to build a shared vision of the change that we need. That 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 comes very strongly out of the report and about the presentation earlier. And that isn't always easy. I mean, we all argue over education and what it's meant to do. But looking at the past experiences of ourselves and others, um, and sometimes having your successes recognised by others, because the day you facilitated discussion about our past changes, actually we heard many of ourselves talk and many others talk about the successes mm -hmm. of what we've done uh, where you can focus too much sometimes on the problems i mean uh, to build that trust and relationships i think though and the stakeholder engagement you have to think about the context in which you're working um the economic context even can be can be seem far away from education but actually if you're not spending enough money on education or if you're cutting expenditure that can impact on the whole mood for it, the timing of the change, and also the industrial relations climate between teachers, schools, and, and governments at, the, at, at a particular time. Now, ironically, uh, like the experience talked about in Denmark, I think COVID may have helped. It has forced us into a greater uh, collaborative effort on many, many areas of policy. And I think the other thing COVID has done, it has given a much, in Ireland anyway, a much, much stronger voice to students. Um, and and they've been at the centre of decisions about uh, examinations and so on. And I mean, certainly I take away from this whole project that the need to have that conversation in Ireland. Now, we have invested in that conversation in Ireland or at least part of it for a number of years. So we've had pretty good structures in Ireland for discussing curriculum development. We have a national council that does that for us. What I think you've shown to us, we're less successful in ongoing consultation about how to implement. Mm -hmm. um, and that point that teachers, I think, in the past in Ireland may not feel that they are being really represented within the structures about implementation. And sometimes they don't believe that the teacher representatives actually represent them. <laughs> the legitimacy of their own representatives are sometimes questioned. We certainly need to engage students better. 
So even though we have good structures about curriculum um, consultation, we have much weaker structures about exams, assessment and implementation, and we really need to improve that. And that is you've posed a question to us now, and we certainly intend to look at that. I think there's a really good lesson for others also mm -hmm. in terms of both stakeholder engagement and implementation. The emphasis that you place in the report on research and perhaps th there wasn't enough of that, perhaps even in the presentation, I thought th just earlier. Um, we've certainly taken the notion that all this change has to be research informed. Um, our own curriculum council is engaged in a lot of research. We've brought in outside bodies like the OECD for the next phase of our, our development to research how best other countries have done it, how it might apply in Ireland. And we've built on internal national research about our junior cycle implementation, which is the lower secondary level and lessons from COVID um, and also ongoing findings from things like school inspection, which have really which we hoped to, would would help to inform change as well. Um, I think you've posed the biggest questions for today for me about planning the logistics of how it happens. Um, I mean, I've mentioned that cons those consultative mechanisms, but there needs to be another layer of mechanisms to steer and implement change. How do you get stakeholders involved in that? Because if you do it in a participative uh, way, it can be quite slow and not agile enough, um, and it can take too long, and it may not always impact at the local level. Um, and I think you, you, the um, Edith raised the issue at the la end of the last session about the political cycle, the need for the political support. But it, but you can't. It's hard to sustain that over several political cycles. Yet we know the time is needed for change. So I think the way I think we're going to go about thinking about it is in winning hearts and minds to think of it as a storytelling, a constant need for storytelling, it's telling the story of what your ambition is. It has to be easily understood, despite the fact that it's complex and slow. I mean, to, to get key competences into the curriculum the way we want is an intensely challenging process. It needs a lot of time, but it has to feel real. So it has to be easily explainable to parents, to students, to prospective parents and students as well and the wider public. So we're trying to think out what are quick wins? What are quick, significant changes that tell the narrative of the change, that point in the direction of the change? We will hope to use piloting, as you've suggested, um, but we we want to get that down to teacher level where it's meaningful change for them, not that uh, theoretical one. Um, and for us in Ireland, we also think that it has to link with other policies properly. It has to be coherent with our policies for special education, for social disadvantage and, and wider policies like our STEM education, climate change, well-being, because if we present it as an isolated initiative, it just appears to schools as an overloaded curriculum, mm -hmm. as the school trying to solve all problems. And immediately you've lost the mm -hmm. teacher audience in that in that in that regard. Thank you. You thank mentioned. You so, thank you so much, Harold. There, there's just so much in there, I think, not only for our audience that are logged on, but other things that we can ask other participants to mm. to pick up on. I think a, a really important point you, you made at the beginning and, and you used the word genuine, genuine engagement of stakeholders and the sense of that ongoing. It's not really about consultancy. It's about ongoing engagement, participation and I think that that is, is such an important point. And given that the engagement of stakeholders was one of the, the challenges that was highlighted in the um, Mentimeter. The other thing I'd like to pick up on is research. As you said, Harold, we could say more about that. 
but it's also about um, not only drawing on evidence-informed research, but how do we actually have a better understanding of how to access and critically review research so that we can use it in a meaningful and helpful way. Um, is, is there one last point you want to make, Carol, before we move on to, to Peter's views? Well, I think you've, you've, I've gone away with thinking a lot about uh, teacher capacity, but particularly in the area of assessment. Um, I think if we don't make the assessment meaningful for students and teachers and, and preserve their trust in it, um, then we actually won't succeed in the in the curricular reforms yeah. um and and we might discuss that further perhaps in in the in the questions yeah. thank you for that and i think the whole point you were making about the narrative and keeping the narrative going and making sure that it connects to all those involved in the policy reform implementation and evaluation is, is so important Peter, I turn to you now, Peter Lucas from the, the Netherlands, and also in terms of from the Netherlands perspective, can you share your thoughts about how you bring attention to the, the reform process so that there is that connection between policy and stakeholders in a more successful way, effective way? Yes, of course I can. And first I want to thank uh, Harold Hisler because what he said, I totally agree. And I nearly wanted to say, you can take my time to elaborate on that uh, thing. <laughs> but that's perhaps a, a subject for another uh, conference. Uh, I will take the time. Thank you for, uh, for having that uh, time to emphasize on two things, the stakeholder engagement, how we did it, the Dutch way, and some remarks on communication and uh, trust. Uh, but first, I will go back a little bit in history because the latest curriculum reform for us, the Dutch, started in 2017 and it is still work in progress. Uh, and there was a need and also a will to reconsider the current program with core goals and elaborate goals on, uh, for, for the, uh, the, the, the program for the exams, etc. And in general, the determination of what should be in the program was made in 2007 by institutions and not so much by teachers. And that was one lesson. And perhaps the lack of direct commitment by students, no, not also by students, but also by, by teachers, may lead to a feeling by teachers of, well, I wait and I will read in the textbook what is elaborated for my subject. So mm. I, I will wait. Uh, and I won't tell you too much about how we started the, 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 the process, but uh, two things are very important. The Ministry of Education decided that the curriculum should be reconsidered. And there were some basic uh, design elements. One was that, and I think Harold also mentioned it, three quarters of the time should be spent on the subject now, leaving a time for a school curriculum. So the schools could decide themselves what to do. Second was very important, uh, the importance that it was led by teachers and not also led by, but we ask or the, the ministry asked the teachers to give the proposals. And of course, they were helped by curriculum developers, but the, decide, but the decision was by the teachers and the school uh, leaders. And of course, there was a steering uh, committee with uh, the key actors. Well, that also was very important, but the key element was uh, all the subjects were taken in consideration, but also led to the possibility to see where key uh, competences could be implemented. And uh, some subjects were grouped together because they were more or less uh, uh, in the same direction, like the geography, history and economy. But there were also some specific uh, groups, digital skills and uh, competences for civil society. But inclusion, and that's one important thing, the inclusion of the competences was arranged in the design from the start. In the meantime, we also tried to emphasize those key uh, competences by presenting the groups a study how now no, first of all what the key uh, competences were and how you could implement them and that was of course a balance because we said the teachers are in the lead so we had to inform them and give them information and have the trust very important word that they should do something with it a third way was that before the start of the groups we asked universities higher vocational education etc what in their eyes was essential for new students 
And they said most important are basic skills and competences, at least more important than to know certain aspects of volcanoes or what happened in the 80 years uh, war of the, of, of the Dutch. Uh, so that feared the teachers, the groups to take that in mind. And they took it in mind because the, the, the goal was to present proposals for a, a future proof curriculum for the pupils, for the, stu for the students. We also organized feedback for the stakeholders and it also led to a discussion, also perhaps another subject, who is to decide what the curriculum should be? Is that the teacher? Is that the student? Are that the parents? Are that, are, is it society? Is it the politicians? But in the end we said it should not be only the teachers to decide, so we organized a whole setup of uh, meetings and uh, possibilities to react first by writing and later we realized that speaking and meeting was essential and that is also a very important thing that we learned from the uh, for the imp uh, implementation we also learned several things that it was very difficult for individual teachers to respond to a product like what is the vision on a certain subject because teachers are mostly interested in what's in it for me at the moment and how to implement it at the school level. So for us, it was very important and also a lesson for the implementation. Of course, very important to uh, to grab the teachers, but when do you do it and what do you ask them? Uh, and it was also important to involve teacher organizations, the unions and those organized around a, a certain subject because they could be uh, well, the messenger of the message and had also the possibility to involve uh, all kinds of, uh, well, teacher uh, organizations. Um, very important talk with the teachers and not to the teachers. The second point is that brings me to the communication and uh, trust. I skip a lot because I see the time is uh, running out. Um, it's not so difficult to reach teachers and school leaders, but it is difficult because that is sending a message. But important is to decide what is the right moment and with what message do you reach them in the heart in order to take a reaction to respond or to give feedback or whatever. So when is it effective for the receiver? Not from your perspective, but when is it effective for the, for the receiver? That is very important. And as I mentioned, uh, communicate too early. Teachers think, well, this is not interesting and they will never react again. If you do it too late, then they say, well, you could inform me earlier because what will you do with my reaction at the moment? That was also something that we uh, included in the feedback loops. We organized feedback. We made an analysis of it. We reported it back to the organization that gave a reaction in order to give them the possibility to say, OK, they listened to me or they didn't listen to me, but that was the reason. Very important to give trust and to be trustworthy yourself. So uh, that's for us very important. And it is also important, uh, well, I, I've noticed it is try to be the guest on a popular party instead of organizing a party of your own, because then you invite yourself to a group that is already united. For instance, the, the, the unions or a school or what, whatever. Uh, and that is an other perspective than you give teachers the possibility to come to you. So yeah. go to the teachers, very important. At last, a very important lesson we learned is that policymakers should stick what they said before, because one major uh, well, question was, let the teachers make the proposals. And when they proposed it to the Ministry of Education, way back in October 12, uh, not 12, uh, 2019, the politician said, well, okay, but what is your support base? And mm -hmm. of course, the support base is not the 180 teachers that were involved in the direct organization of the proposals, the feedback, whatever. But there are 60,000 teachers. And mm -hmm. of course, there is no possibility. Well, no possibility. I think it's 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 an illusion to think that all 60,000 will react. So mm -hmm. politicians said, you did what we do. You, you did what we asked you, but now we want to know what is the scientific base and what is the support base. And changing the, the rules made it for the teachers that were involved, um, well, very hard to believe that what they did was meaningful. Yeah. So to end, two words are important, trust and time. To give trust, trust has no price, 
but gives pride for those you give it to and give time, time to talk. And many teachers that were involved said we did it now on the national level. What we wanted every school or every teacher of a school is to have those discussions we had at the school level. So that's not too organized at the moment for, for us, yeah. before, but to talk and give trust, give time. That's what I wanted to end with as the yeah. words very important. Trust and time are certainly important, Peter, and, and I think your point about not talking to teachers, but with teachers and, yes. and also listening to teachers um, so that they, they actually have a voice that can be meaningful. Um, you also mentioned about the unit, the unions and the involvement with, with them and, and when is the right time for engagement with teachers and other stakeholders. So it would be helpful to turn to, to Susan now, Susan Glocken from ETUS in terms of, of your thoughts. Can, can you share your thoughts about the involvement of teachers as key stakeholders in policy design, implementation and evaluation? Susan, what, what do you see as the role of teachers and when should they be involved? You're, you're still on mute, Susan. Sorry, I had unmuted earlier and uh, OK. Um, so thank you very much for those many questions and good afternoon to everybody. <laughs> and uh, thank you also for the panelists who have spoken already uh, previously on this point. Um, and for this, uh, the key uh, competences uh, recommendations, they're really interesting to read and I do think very useful um, as well. And of course, for us, um, indeed, the key words are transparency, um, the uh, trust that we heard about, um, because that will help with the ownership um, of, the, of, the, of any reforms or bringing on board uh, the, the competences. Um, very important part is indeed the inclusion, the involvement of the teachers of, um, and of course, as unions, we speak on behalf of the teachers. So using that voice um, and uh, seeking dialogue and not only consultation, but really meaningful dialogue for a change. Um, so um, we do have seen also throughout the COVID-19 pandemic um, countries that have engaged and we have stories that are positive indeed, which is, is really good to see that for the sheer need to really bring on board the teachers because they are the practitioners, they're there daily. And so you, you best take on board what, what, you know, to hear the voices and what works. But we do have also, unfortunately, many examples where countries just use this top down approach. Um, and then, of course, it didn't work. Um, we saw also parents who are then confused who turn to the school leaders who haven't got the answers to the teachers who haven't got the answers. So this involvement uh, is really important at the beginning uh, when considering and uh, designing um, the uh, reforms um, and then, of course, throughout the implementation. What is also really important is to keep this um, continuous uh, or regular monitoring and being prepared to adapt, not taking for granted that because we've implemented something and we had such long discussions to put it in place that it's going to work. It is part of, of this whole development um, to, uh, of, they to have trial and error, to, to be prepared that things will need to be adapted. In the course of, of how things are changing, COVID-19 has asked for many changes and very quick changes uh, in, in education, as we have seen. But there are other issues as well that, that are indeed um, need to be addressed. A very big challenge in education, of course, is that we are doing this in a context where there are serious teacher shortages in Europe. Um, and not only on the side of teachers as such, but also education perso um, support personnel. Um, it's very difficult um, to adapt um, and make changes in that environment. Teachers are already stressed um, because there have been so many um, uh, uh, yeah, changes um, and adaptations that have been often very short term. Um, so um, that is a it's a difficult context. Um, and so the timing um, aspect that we were just talking about is crucial. Um, then the the other 
topic I wanted to address here is as well, we do need, when we talk about key competences, we're talking also about training for teachers. So the investment we talked about um, is very important. And we coming, we really um, focus also on this public investment, this commitment um, from public authorities to this public good, which is there to uh, provide quality education to all. That's, that's our goal that we're talking about. We need to make that investment also in the training. So there's the infrastructure to provide the basis, but we need the training for teachers um, to provide those competences. So we need to ask also what are the needs of the teachers, of the school leaders. Um, and that's very important in, in this discussion. Um, and when we talk about, um, as I started with the, the importance of dialogue and social dialogue um, and the inclusion, um, one of the um, forms, and it, I'm very happy to see this also mentioned in the report, is indeed this effective distributed uh, leadership. So that, that's what we see that that works really well because it fosters the engagement um, it takes up the ideas, it invites for ideas um, and a positive approach to this. So I'll, I'll, I'll conclude on this um, uh, here um, because I think we'll have more points to discuss further on. Thank you, Susan. And, and you raised um, that important word about, you know, that sense of transparency in what's happening and, and also uh, reminding us that the complexity of the reform process is also made even more difficult when we have shortages of teachers um, right across Europe and beyond and the challenges for schools in trying to bring in reform when they are dealing with um, trying to find teachers to, to work with the students in the classroom. So I think that was a very timely reminder of, of the challenges. And again, I think that takes us back to Harold's point about the, the communication of the narrative and getting across what is meaningful and what is, is purposeful for the schools and how do we help them to, to manage things like teacher shortages and reform at the same time and being very conscious of the context within which reform happens. So thank you for those points. And now I, I it's time to, to hear from the student voice in terms of, we, we heard um, Peter talk there about future proof, proof the curriculum for students. So I thought that, Reyes, you might be uh, uh, really your ears picking up on that. What does a, a curriculum that involves key, key competences look like from your perspective? And when should students be involved in this reform process? What are your thoughts? Yes, uh, thank you for answering having so uh, Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I've listened to, to your contributions very, very closely, and I've also gone over the, the recommendations. And I'm very happy to see that within the, the document for the, for the recommendations for um, key competences, um, a good chunk of the recommendations are actually centered of involving stakeholders and namely um, school students as um, as main stakeholders. And I'm very happy to see that. Um, as for um, to, to answer your, your, your question precisely, um, working in the past few years with uh, school student representatives and being involved in curriculum uh, design process at all levels, um, what we've, the conclusion that we've come to is that um, it's not so much as to um, what is the, the, the technical side of it uh, when, in terms of um, um, stakeholder engagement, because oftentimes school students, truth be told, do not have the, uh, the background, the academic background to be able to um, come up with um, curriculum on their own or to um, be able to create um, a bottom-up approach, um, but that does not mean uh, under any circumstances that the input that we bring to the table is not relevant or should not be uh, regarded as being as being relevant. Um, and when looking at the at the process of engaging school students in, in creating school curriculum and in school democracies in, in general, um, what I believe is, is very, very important is to um, remember the fact that um, Oftentimes, we, we see that, that approach on behalf of, of school administrations and of governments when trying to engage school students and teachers alike. Um, they wonder why, why teachers, why school students don't, don't, don't get engaged or why um, they, they're reticent in doing so. And the truth is that oftentimes these processes um, are just so purely technical and purely um, uh, rigid in a sense that the participation of key stakeholders uh, is not seen as being meaningful and does not have a meaningful output. 
So in return, um, of course, there is a big, a big sense of, uh, um, yeah, reticence towards these, uh, towards the, these processes. But um, our perspective on on the matter is that, uh, in order to be able to attract school students and to attract stakeholders and to actually bringing their input and being honest and relevant input to the table, is um, of course having them engaged during the entire process, because we have to think of a, of a coherent process. So not only the, the design part of for for policies and curriculum, but also the part about implementation and evaluation, because um, we cannot think of one without the other. Of course, if you involve stakeholders in the design part but not in the evaluation part, then of course you're missing um, a key set of benchmarks um, in which could help you evaluate the performance of the set curriculum or the set policy. So, um, because I've seen that everyone has given sort of a, of a key word to sum up their 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 statement. Um, for for us, it will be first of all coherence. So having stakeholders and namely for us school students involved during the entire process in, in a meaningful and and constant way. Um, and of course, we're also talking about um, talking about. Um, processes which are adapted to, to, to school students uh, understanding to school students needs that doesn't mean by 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 any chance uh, dumping it down or um, whatever um, um, whatever else you might think of but rather creating safe and inclusive spaces for school students to be able to voice their opinions in an organized manner and that also entails support um, from school administrations or from from governments um, for school students to be able to self-organize and to be able to create their own, uh, their own organizations and their own democratic fora to be able to debate these issues to be able to make democratic decisions which they can integrate and and further take up in the policy design and uh, implementation and evaluation process um, so i think this is very much essential and it very much ties into the, the transparency component that everyone has referred to so far in that if you have stakeholders, be they um, school students, be they teachers, involved in policy making processes, everyone will wonder how did they end up there? How were they selected? What happened? Uh, and um, the issue of integrity, um, I think, brings such a um, can, can bring a lot of um, decredibilization so fast and for absolutely no reason when transparency is it, it's it's right there. It's it's really within our reach. So enabling school students to 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 self organize and to have democratic structures which are transparent and open about their processes, is definitely a way to to bring transparency into this uh, stakeholder engagement process. Um, and yes, in in the end, I think um, that the bottom line would be um, not only to see. Um, because unfortunately, you know, we we have these sorts of conferences and these sorts of recommendations, and they're they're amazing. They're done by experts who know what they're talking about, who have a very very firm grasp on the topic. But unfortunately, the the question still remains up to this date: How do we um, get rid of the tokenistic approach, which, in a in a in a good moment uh, or in, in good settings, only happens in the case of school students? But unfortunately, oftentimes it happens in the case of all stakeholders which are brought to the table, um, maybe for a, for, for a photo or just to, to sign a, a presence sheet that they were at the table, um, it's, it no longer works like this. And we've seen this, especially after the pandemic, when everyone is lost, um, unnecessarily, in my opinion, um, because when the policymakers are, are lost, all they have to do is turn towards the, the, the main beneficiaries, which are school students and, and of, course, uh, of course, teachers. So uh, we are the, the, the light guiding this process, and I think we should... Um, we should act upon it accordingly. Thank you, Reyes, for that really uh, important uh, in pointing out these important points. And I, I was going to to ask you in terms of what would be your advice around how um, you build the capacity of students to engage in policy initiatives. But actually, you you suggested creating these safe spaces to develop the capacities for students and to help them to self-organize and to, to build up the, the sense of confidence in their engagement in what they're doing. So thank you for those words of advice. And I'm sure that um, the involvement of students, um, as you've seen in the recommendations, as a key stakeholder was, was quite strongly organized. And it was certainly discussed all the way through the peer learning groups that I was involved in. And so um, I, I think that um, I hope that you have some feeling that students are being involved uh, to a greater capacity, although I think uh, in terms of, of what we've heard of the need for more teacher professional development around engagement, there's more need for also professional development almost for the students 
or at least learning opportunities for the students around their engagement and building their capacity. And I'm sure that uh, Obesu will continue to have a role in that. So thank you. We now have the opportunity to hear from two countries who weren't directly involved in the key competence project in the peer learning groups. And so it will be really interesting to hear the fresh perspectives from our last two panelists in terms of their thoughts about the, the application of the recommendations in their country. So first I'll turn to, to Carmen uh, Cabello Martinez from Spain. Uh, and I'd like to ask you, what are your thoughts about the recommendations and how um, are they applied already, perhaps, in the context of Spain? And perhaps you could say something in particular, Carmen, about the evaluation of the key competence policy, because it was one of the things that was picked up in the Mentimeter about something we need to think more about. OK, well, hello, my name is Carmen Caballero. I work for the Ministry of Education in Spain. Well, first of all, uh, let me congratulate you on the excellent work you've done. I think that the publication of this recommendation for policymakers is particularly relevant in this moment, since many of us are somehow involved in different initiatives related to the promotion of competence-based education. Uh, broadly speaking, the recommendations make complete sense to me. I really appreciate the down-to-earth approach, and I'm sure they will be very, very helpful for all of us. In fact, I could say that most of them could be directly applied in my daily work, but of course, some others should have to be adapted to our context. Let me make a few remarks about the document based on my own experience in the ministry. As you may know, in Spain, we are now finishing the design of a new national curriculum which proposes a competence-based approach. This curriculum is due to enter into force in next academic year. If I think about the works we've finished until now, I must say that we have followed most of the recommendation mentioned in the document. For example, regarding the need of listening to the voices of the stakeholders from the earliest stage of policy design, the Ministry of Education organized an online forum called A New Curriculum for an Advanced Society in November, December 2020. The forum consisted of five working sessions where university experts, representative of teachers, schools, trade unions, politicians, and other educational sector could share ideas and discuss. As the recommendations say, we were careful in choosing the participant trying to cover the full range of stakeholders. We even had the honor of having a representative for the Portuguese Education Ministry sharing good practices with us. In parallel, we opened our public participation procedure to collect questions and contributions from the whole education community. And in view of the success of the, the event, some other online discussion forums have been organized in them, tailored to specific topics, assessment, teacher training, educational orientation, inspectorate, school leaders, students, families, and so on. And then, well, when we started the design of the curriculum, we discussed a lot about how a national curriculum can help to move forward a competence-based model. And we learned from other countries, particularly from Portugal, that a very good point of departure was to draw a profile of the students to identify and define the key competencies that students are expected to have developed in a specific moment of the training path. In our case, we choose the end of the compulsory stage of education, normally 16 years in Spain. Well, this profile is the foundation for change in the curriculum, should be something like the matrix that supports curricular decision, strategies, and methodological orientation. 
So we worked with the eight key competencies for lifelong learning in the recommendation of the Council in the 2018, adapted to the goals of Spanish law of education. And we also referred the profile to the challenges of the 23rd century. And for each of the eight key competencies, we have defined a set of operational indicators. Then, of course, we are aware that changes must be built on existing policies and practices. But at the same time, we wanted to take advantage of the excellent work that many individual people and schools are already doing in this competence-based approach. To this end, the new national curriculus curriculum tries to avoid a very prescriptive, prescriptive tone to facilitate schools and teachers progress towards a competence-based approach, depending on the times, possibilities, needs, but without imposing top-down rules that could produce disruptions and radical breaks in part of the education community. For example, traditional subject areas are maintained in the new curriculum, but schools and teachers are invited to organize them into bigger learning areas to facilitate the integration of competences. We've also designed a new curriculum element that we call specific competences. These specific competences establish the performance that students must be able to display in activities or situations whose approach requires the basic knowledge of the subject area. These specific competencies are designed under the framework of the operational indicators of the output profile of the students. Regarding the question about the specific contextual elements that are important in the case of Spain, I must say that the most relevant one is probably a consequence of the distribution of powers in education between the national level and the regional levels in Spain. The Ministry of Education designs the main framework from the national curriculum. But then the 17 different autonomous communities are responsible of its development and implementation. And these autonomous communities are also responsible of school organization and teacher training, which are two particular important issues regarding the implementation of a competent-based learning approach. That's why the Ministry of Education is making special efforts to strengthen the communication between different policy levels and provide support and guidance for all. In this respect, we are preparing a lot of materials to help teachers and schools to implement the new curriculum. These materials will, be, uh, will, will have free access in the internet. Also, we are planning a set on online activities or teacher training and more than 40,000 teachers from all over the country are expected to participate in them. And then if I have to talk about which aspects of the recommendation are most useful for us right now, it's exactly what you have just asked me. I must say everything related to evaluation. Since our time limits, prevent us from piloting, piloting the implementation of the new curriculum, which is something we, I wish we could have done. Evaluation is particularly important to identify and address those aspects that may need some adjustments. And, design, and to this end, a special unit is going to be created in the organic structure of the Ministry of Education to contribute to the permanent updating of the curriculum in cooperation with autonomous communities. Mm -hmm. And well, I think that's all. And thank you very much for your attention. And I hope I haven't overrun my speaking time. Thank you, Carmen. It's, it's, um, 
very interesting to hear about the, the matrix you're creating in terms of the profile of students and how all of the elements have been put in in relation to the key competences and something that I'm sure that people would like to know more about is how they align with assessment and um, manage that situation of, of looking at not only summative assessment but more formative processes and it would be it would have been very good to have had time to go into that in more detail but um, very interesting to hear about the the unit that's being set up to look specifically at evaluation so thank you for your input and we will try and turn to some of the questions in the um the chat but before we do we have our last panelist uh Yaroslav Falten from the Czech Republic and again, uh, not directly involved in the key competence project peer learning groups, but uh, we're very interesting, Yaroslav, to hear about the application of the recommendations either already in Czech Republic or, or something in the future that you feel can be learned from looking at the recommendations. Thank you very much for the invitation. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm of course uh, going to respond to uh, your question, but before that, uh, I'll dare to go a bit uh, into the history as it uh, illustrates the situation in this country and uh, its specific way of implementing the, the key competencies. And I also would like to thank uh, all, all the all the colleagues for their previous uh, inputs and uh, and for their ideas. And. Uh, I would like to say that uh, in Czech Republic we implement key competences uh, for more than 18 years as they were implemented uh, into the curriculum first in 2005 and in 2021 uh, later on we uh, added the digital competence but I will come back uh, to, to, that, uh, to that later. So more than those uh, 70 years ago then uh, the introduction uh, of this new concept uh, took place without uh, unfortunately conducting sufficiently wide professional or either wide public debate uh, as at that time uh, broader collaborative approaches uh, to reforms were not quite common uh, in, in Czech Republic and only a small percentage of schools were involved in the previous piloting of completely new concepts uh, of uh, key competences. Unfortunately, the consequences of this way of managing change are still visible here as the necessary space has not been yet created in the school curriculum for the development of competences. Although, uh, of course, the development of the child's key competences uh, is uh, undoubtedly very time consuming, uh, both for the preparation of activities and for their own uh, implementation, but also evaluation and appropriate feedback for each learner. So that uh, he can develop his uh, own personal competences uh, effectively. The second pitfall of competence reform in our country was that schools and teachers didn't, uh, did not receive necessary support to integrate competences into the education process, uh, into, into the classroom life and especially quality teaching materials and uh, materials for the development of, uh, and assessment of pupils' competences uh, uh, were missing. Uh, so, uh, we uh, still do not uh, have dedicated research for the actual implementation of uh, competences, but thanks uh, to the school inspectorate, uh, we work with uh, data on school curricula and uh, on the work of uh, schools on developing pupil skills. So, we know that in general competences are not uh, developed systematically at schools um, in Czech Republic. So far, it is most successful in pre-primary and primary education. But the further we go to higher levels of education, uh, the lower the quality of competence development is. This is in direct conflict, of course, with the fact that uh, the process of uh, developing key competences should be uh, graded uh, throughout the uh, education pathway. Uh, what's, uh, why, why is this happening uh, or why was this happening? Uh, teachers in Czech Republic often perceive the tension between the content uh, of their subject or subject fields uh, and the competences uh, on the other hand, not uh, the opportunities to interconnect them. Then part of the teacher's work depends on quality of the teaching materials and it is clear that 
schools need guidance and quality teaching materials to implement competences successfully. Uh, within the primary stage, textbooks often develop faster. Primary educators do not have a subject burden as much um, and are much more child-centered, have more child-centered learning and naturally focus more on, on the competences. Then the higher the level of education is, there is less emphasis on, on the learning processes themselves and therefore there's less development of uh, key competencies at Czech schools. Both are unintentional uh, according to the uh, inspectorate data, uh, but, uh, but uh, this is, this is the, uh, the reality. The basic problem lays at the level of the policy, from my view, and the policy expects that the schools will implement competencies uh, on one hand and uh, on, on, on the other one. On the other one, they will not. So the, the system level must implement competencies first and provide schools with guidance, support uh, and uh, quality learning texts, uh, quality verification tools, uh, assessment tools so that the teachers have these things ready before they are in, in, in charge to implement uh, the reform. And as teachers will always look uh, and work, uh, look on their work uh, partially, unintentionally, work unintentionally, uh, their work will be based on, on the things that are available to them as, as a means of, uh, of support. So what the Czech experience uh, says, of course, the top-down reform direction doesn't work. Schoolwork uh, boundaries are needed rather than some certain target categories of what the student should be able to do at, uh, at the output from the education. <clears throat> and teachers do not identify themselves with the target categories automatically, which, uh, which uh, was probably uh, something what characterized the past, the history, but it's it's not the real, a reality anymore. So there is a need for quality teaching uh, aids for teaching so that it is more natural for teachers to link higher competence goals with the subject ones uh, so that they do not see a contradiction in, in between. It is necessary to make a great effort to ensure that there is enough knowledge from evaluation activities for the teacher to be uh, able uh, uh, to be able to reflect on it so that he can uh, approach his teaching by evaluating it not only from an actual point of view, but also from the point of view of the competence development, something which is which is overarching uh, the, the single moment, which is rather long term. Uh, and formative feedback as a means of support should be directed uh, to the teachers. Primarily, it's important that the teacher can reflect his, uh, his own work first. Uh, and uh, competences have proven to be the most difficult concept for Czech schools in recent years. And this still persists and there is undoubtedly a need for further communication from all stakeholders or between all stakeholders uh, on, uh, on key competences and support for schools to, to implement them. Uh, I would say that uh, the concept uh, of the key competences is uh, definitely correct and, and uh, relevant but uh, most of our schools still do not know how to work with uh, the competencies. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a too complex issue for them. But in, uh, uh, in 2021, we added a digital competence into the curriculum, which happened on the basis of two years of uh, piloting and also on the basis of widely accepted and publicly discussed and inspectorate uh, data-based education policy strategy uh, of the Czech Republic until 2030. And of course, schools received support in the form of teaching materials and digital devices and professional development support, plus new stuff for the IT administration. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is uh, the interconnection of the several corresponding policies uh, in practice, which uh, Harold Zizlop already spoke about mm -hmm. uh, a while ago. And schools now spontaneously participate in the reform since last year. So we see that such a mission is possible either in the specific country context, including 30 years of transition to democracy and introducing democratic, democratic principles in various uh, societal 
processes. So it is definitely the role of the ministry in our country to conduct ongoing and participative stakeholders uh, debate. I would just uh, conclude by saying that uh, I consider the recommendation to engage stakeholders in the design of policy, policy initiatives to be absolutely crucial. And with good participative leadership, it will ensure a realistic setup of the reform and its later acceptance by, by the stakeholders. Uh, I would like to emphasize that I personally consider the draft recommendation, uh, the draft recommendations to be justified and, and, and very well thought. Um, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you for your, your presentation. And um, it, it's, it's interesting when Harold at the, the very beginning of this panel finished his presentation, he talked about that looking to the future would be looking at the secondary in terms of secondary school in terms of implementing key competences or or further developing and enhancing them. And um, you're, you're mentioning about the challenges of the secondary school level in terms of the interconnection between the key competences and the, the individual subjects. So um, thank you for that. And thank you for also your validation of the recommendations. And we just have, I think, some time to turn to Karsten and to, to see if there are some questions that uh, our audience would like to ask of the panel. Well, we have uh, at least some reflections in the in the chats, uh, which are very interesting. And uh, we have uh, one from from Kirkham Glynn, especially. Um, I, I can read it loud, and and you can you can um, have a have a think about it. Uh, it says, unless there are rapid changes in the style and content of university faculties of education and other faculties producing teachers and continuing postgraduate education and in-service training. Competency education will take as long as the Irish story to be told. So combining social interaction with olds and uh, 21st century technology is one route to success, um, she said, and, and, and it goes on. But, but what do you think uh, about, about this question? Maybe uh, <laughs> Harold will be <laughs> the right one to address it. Harold, any thoughts about the university faculties in terms of their changing their, their processes? Are you still with us, Harold? Yes, I am. Um, well, I think the, the 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 issue the issue is not simply universities and 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 um, on their own. I, I I mean I think that um, we have to have a change of mindset about valuing the competences because there is a there is a sense and I I, I pick it up from from the Czech experience that. We are happy with knowledge in many cases in education system and blocks of knowledge that people can repeat. We're less clear in our own minds about how competences can be displayed, but particularly how they can be assessed. And I think there's a real challenge and it crosses all of our countries and systems or very many of them. How do you develop assessment tools that have the legitimacy that traditional exams of knowledge can can have um, and that also give parity of esteem to the skills and competences as much as they do to blocks of knowledge. And I mean, if we're developing different pathways for students at upper secondary level, I mean, you'll find in many systems where um, either a particular pathway leads to, say, vet or vocational uh, education and training. It has sometimes less esteem, less high regard, because it's not so much seen as blocks of knowledge leading to academic success. Mm. I mean, and we, we face that challenge. And I mean, certainly for us in Ireland at upper secondary level, it's developing a form of assessment that does give parity of esteem to different forms of competences and knowledge. Mm. And, and we have to then get and it's a challenge for us in Ireland. We have to get universities, but other other parts of further further and higher education to accept the legitimacy of mm -hmm. those. And if we don't do that, parents and students will not trust competences, mm -hmm. and they will not trust the assessments. Um, and 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 the result of that is that the teachers, in the end, 
will not be interested in them because mm -hmm. they will not uh, they will not um, be convinced that the student and parent will actually value this approach. Mm -hmm. And so it's a huge cultural change. And that's why I, I use the word storytelling. I think there's a constant story to be told and retold over this and demonstrated. And, and maybe that's why we need to get quick wins and quick changes. Uh, I mean, the, the the example that we had earlier of, um, from Maria Amelia in Portugal, it, it would be mirrored exactly as it is in Ireland, in, in exactly the same way. It's interesting, Harold, because we're not even talking about one story because it's actually multiple stories of how do you communicate the message to universities, how do you communicate the message to parents, how do you communicate it to students, to teachers and so on. And so we begin to see the complexity of a communication strategy that has to unfold throughout the whole period of the design and the implementation and the evaluation, but it has to, to not only connect to multiple stakeholders, but it's also got to be heard and understood and valued as something legitimate. Um, yes. So I think that's a, a really interesting point. Um, Karsten, is there anything else that you want us to draw attention to and to ask of the panel before we conclude? Well, unfortunately, uh, the time is already uh, five o'clock and, and we, we, we kind of need to close at, at 5.30. Uh, but there are some interesting uh, remarks still in the chats that, that you can reflect on and perhaps you can reply in the chats uh, if you have the time. Um, but thank you so much to, uh, to uh, Kay for facilitating the two panels. Thank you so much for all the panelists to uh, to uh, to participate and for your valuable inputs so thank you so much thank you and now we turn to uh the last agenda point before the closing remarks and uh, that is an input from the european commission from ulrike uh, pisiotis uh so christian if we could have the slides up again please and then i will just hand over the floor to Ulrike, who is going to uh, talk about initiatives to support broad competence development and better achievement of basic skills. So the slide should be up here. The much, floor Carson. is yours. Thank you very much and good afternoon to everybody. So I would like to give you an overview of different commission initiatives that are related uh, to advancing uh, the development of key competences and basic skills. And some of those initiatives have already been mentioned today, either in panels or in the chat. So I'm really happy that I can give you a little bit more context here. And in line with the thematic of this conference and the study it's based on, I concentrate on those initiatives that target school education in particular. So next slide, please. And these are the four areas in school education where we are currently working on a number of initiatives together with member states. And those are blended learning pathways to school success, teachers and trainers and learning for the green transition. And I'm going to give you a brief overview on each of them. Next slide, please. So last year in 2021, the EU member states adopted a council recommendation on blended learning uh, at primary and secondary education levels. And this was on the one hand, an immediate response to the lessons learned from the COVID-19 crisis. It highlights challenges that have been exposed during school closures and uh, the remedial actions. And on the other hand, it also presents a more long-term opportunity to work on a future learning model that blends learning tools and learning environments effectively to support and further improve key competences. And as you can see also here from the examples in brackets, this relates to uh, digital tools, um, of course, but it also and equally relates to non-digital tools and environments. 
and uh, the recommendation signposts to all member states the areas of school education systems that may need targeted support. And it also intends to facilitate the sharing of practical examples of a blended learning model uh, to demonstrate how different environments, strategies and tools might be integrated more effectively. Next slide, please. And this I have also posted in the chat today already. And it is, yes, really uh, hot off the press because uh, published by the Commission just uh, Friday last week, actually, uh, a proposal for a council recommendation on learning for environmental sustainability. And the aim of this proposal is to support member states uh, to equip learners at all ages with the knowledge Uh, I have to say this is Hello. Like you just you just uh, you were just frozen for for uh, a few seconds, so perhaps you can just repeat the, the latest your last sentence. Is it is it working now? Is is working now? Yes. <laughs> okay, good. Um, so here, uh, yeah, I just want to mention this uh, is actually uh, this proposal is not directed at school education only, but it really takes a lifelong learning approach and it encourages member states to establish learning for environmental sustainability as a priority area in education and training and by doing so also to invest buildings and grounds uh, and to do so to mobilize national and EU funds and in, encourages them in particular to support whole school and whole institution approaches to sustainability which encompass teaching and learning and really all operations of a school or other education institution. Next slide please. And another initiative that we are uh, going to, to launch uh, this year in 2022 is also a proposal for a council recommendation on pathways to school success. And this uh, recommendation wants to ensure that all learners can complete successfully their educational journey. So pathways, proposes a broad vision for promoting positive system change for inclusion and school success and it aims at addressing simultaneously the two EU level targets, the one on basic skills and also on early leaving from education and training and uh, it aims at raising the level of proficiency in basic skills of as many pupils as possible while also increasing the number of, of young people with an upper secondary qualification. And um, we have touched upon that already uh, quite a few times today. Well-being in, in schools is of course also of great importance uh, to school success. So improving also social and emotional education and learners well-being uh, is key to raising educational outcomes. And this is really the vision behind Pathways. And next slide, please. And yes, this is a topic or these are actors that of course have come up also uh, at different points already in our discussions today because key competence development would not happen without teachers. So therefore the vision um, to also advance and build our European education area really depends on motivated and competent teachers. Um, at the same time, and we are all aware of that, of course, this is a profession that has many challenges. Uh, I'm not going into them here in detail, but what I want to uh, underline is that um, what we uh, know from teachers through services, uh, surveys like TALIS is that they want to have more training uh, on working with students with special needs, 
um, also what comes out strongly again and again, they want to improve digital skills and competences for teaching. And uh, they also want to have more professional development opportunities on teaching in multilingual and multicultural environments. Um, next slide, please. So, uh, and this is one of, of the re responses to support teachers in, uh, in their professional and initial um, uh, training actually, um, the Erasmus Plus Teacher Academies, and they really want to provide an enriched learning uh, with a career long perspective. So meaning targeting both initial teacher education and also um, continuous professional development. And uh, what we want to do here is to cooperate also on key EU priorities such as digital learning, sustainability, equity and inclusion. And they really look at providing joint learning offers um, for both um, uh, student, uh, students and also again uh, serving teachers already. And uh, there is uh, a coordinated and effective uh, mobility schemes um, in different uh, models are, are foreseen. And uh, also uh, we hope that uh, teacher academies can contribute to policy development, uh, for example, because they can then provide first-hand experience on effective teacher education. And obviously there are more initiatives for teachers, um, which I don't have the time now to go into, but um, at the end of this presentation, there will be a slide also with links to all the different initiatives that I refer here. Um, next slide, please. And this is something uh, I want to mention here because uh, that is yeah, something that I uh, or that we consider very uh, important tools that can help educators and learners improve key competences. Um, there are different competence frameworks that have been developed by the Commission's Joint Research Center. I have listed several here, starting with uh, the framework on digital competences and it's different offshoots for consumers, educators and organizations. And there uh, on the left side, you also see Selfie and Selfie for Teachers. These are self-assessment tools that have been created to support the development of digital skills and competences for schools and teachers alike. So they can assess their readiness in their use of technology for learning and also, uh, it can help them identify further training needs. Uh, LifeComp on the right hand corner is the European Competence Framework for Personal, Social and Learning to Learn Competence. And that is another important framework that can be of particular use and interest with regard to well-being and inclusion agendas. The entrepreneurship competence framework defines what it means to have an entrepreneurial mindset, so to turn ideas into action. And um, this uh, doesn't apply only to, to business, but really uh, it, it is meant for every aspect of life. And the last one here on the right lower corner is Green Comp, the sustainability competence framework. And this is the most recent one. It was also released just last Friday together with a council recommendation on learning for environmental sustainability. And this framework intends to help users develop the competences that are needed to live and act sustainably. Next slide, please. So how do we work with, with you, with the member states, with policymakers? Um, probably most of you are aware, um, I'm sure that uh, one important way to work with member states is through our working groups. Those working groups consist of government officials um, appointed by EU member states and other participating countries, as well as representatives from stakeholder organizations and social partners. And uh, you can see the, the working groups that, that we have. Um, at present, and I have 
uh, yeah, highlighted the ones that we have on schools, where we have one subgroup on pathways to school success and another one on education or learning for environmental sustainability. And the focus of these working groups is to, as part of the mutual learning, share information about reforms of national education policies, um, inspire positive change and in general to offer a forum of exchange on experiences and good practices on how to address key challenges. Next slide, please. And of course, another important way to collaborate with uh, and to advance key competence in, part uh, in particular is uh, through participating really in the many opportunities that the Erasmus Plus program and other funding instruments also provide. And here I have listed um, some of them for your in information together um, with links. And for school education, I just want to point out specifically the school education gateway, which provides material and training courses um, for teachers, for example, including on key competence development and also the e-twinning platform, which I, uh, I'm sure most of you know. So the online collaboration platform for teachers and schools in Europe. Um, next slide, please. So here, as promised, more information um, you can find under the links that are provided. And next slide. And of course, uh, you can also drop me an email and uh, if you want more information or have questions. And there is still one more slide because normally the presentation would have finished with a previous slide, but um, what I and what we as a commission would uh, like to hear also from you are your um, ideas and initiatives that you are planning or have already started in the area of key competence. So uh, it, it would be great to hear on your ambitions and initiatives that you envisage in your national context and also and uh, where and how in your view uh, the Commission can best support member states in key competence development and this is obviously in relation to what I have presented but also of course in addition. So uh, I know this has been uh, a long day, a very interesting day but perhaps some of you are tired now but still uh, it would be great to hear from participants here in the in the conference uh, on those plans. So I give the floor back to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ulrike. And uh, as Ulrike mentioned, we we almost have an open mic if you uh, want to uh, share some of your experiences or if you want to uh, mention how. Uh, the Commission could support you to further develop and implement competence-based approaches. Uh, now is the chance. So you can you can um, you can put your questions in the chat, or you can you can raise your hand, and uh, we will try to identify you. As we like I mentioned, it has been a long day, but still. It's not every day that we have an open mic. <laughs> no. Yes, Michael, please. Well, uh, hi, everybody. Sorry, just a uh, few so tempted coming in, in again as there was this reference to teacher education in the previous uh, panel. And now again, I think Harold put a really nice comment, as always, when Harold says anything in the, in the chat, uh, pointing at the importance to support teachers with the teacher um, education and continuous professional development um, efforts. And I think just uh, this is something as, uh, that we have actually strengthened, the Council has strengthened in the teacher, in the key competences recommendation version of 2018, so looking at the need to indeed uh, support uh, teachers. And we have a number of work here. I mean, we've, in some of you, if you know perhaps about the new flagship project of supporting teacher education 
institutions who collaborate on the European level via what we call the teacher academies, Erasmus Plus teacher academies, which, which is one opportunity. And just uh, would just like to um, highlight this as a really as an avenue for further work, as Ulrike has actually also mentioned in the, in the presentation. So thanks, Harold, for the comment. Thank you very much, Michael. Uh, Harold, do you want to uh, to add anything? Uh, well, I, I think actually the 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 Commission's emphasis in the whole work actually around competences, um, building the capability of of all the stakeholders has been a, a theme in the in the Commission's work for some time. I mean. Uh, Michael is right. There's been a strong emphasis on enabling teachers, so investing in teacher education, both initial teacher education and continuing teacher education has been a focus. And and actually, at, at, at subsequent in subsequent work, I think it, it has come up on the the theme of investing in parents as well and the structures around parents to, because you need them to buy into the change that you want as well, as well as the the more recently now in the supports for students. And it's really good to have that um, commonly done across the uh, across countries and, and the Commission's work has been really supportive and influential in that. I think sometimes I wonder, is there a possibility to of, of countries collaborating on the assessment instruments, and I see in the chat there's a reference to a book on a range of assessment instruments and approaches of innovative assessment of practices across Europe. Um, and I, I wonder, is is perhaps there a, a possibility of collaboration on actually building both IT and AI uh, systems that could help assessment development um, across across some of these competences? Because the the investment involved is is very substantial for each individual country. I really thanks. Uh, I mean, to the team who who conceived this project and who allowed us all to learn the lessons from it and, and uh, Michael and the, and the Commission for the funding and so on. Uh, I mean, we, we, owe, we owe them a great debt actually for, for, for facilitating our learning in this way. Thank you very much, Harold. Any last questions before we turn to the conclusion session? We will make sure that the the presentation from today will be uh, available, uh, so that also all the links uh, provided by Ulrike uh, can be uh, accessed by by you. Okay, I think we uh, we will close the this agenda point. So thank you very much, Ulrike, for uh, presenting, and we will now turn to the very last point of today's program. A closing remark by uh, Sophia Eriksson uh, Watershoot. I hope I pronounced it correctly. So the floor is yours, Sophia. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Kirsten, and good afternoon or almost good evening to everyone. I mean, this must be perhaps the worst slot of the agenda, but uh, but I'm here and uh, I've uh, actually listened to a big part of, uh, of the session today. So my first point is really to thank, uh, well, the organizers, of course, but also all the panelists, uh, the participants for I, what I think has been a really stimulating exchange, um, actually very rich. And, and I appreciated that uh, all of you were so generous in sharing both the successes and also some of the challenges that uh, that uh, you have met when when uh, developing and commit for for key competencies. So perhaps a few final reflections, uh, and there's absolutely no intention to uh, sum to summarize this uh, this whole session. It's kind of uh, not my intention. But just to reply to the last uh, Harold, your your uh, invitation. Of course, I would say. We have lots of avenues actually defined here for further collaboration, so it is part of what uh, what we will be thinking of after this uh, seminar. What what could be the priority for next steps of of these exchanges and collaborations? So thanks a lot for the ideas in orally and, and also in this in the chat. I see. Um, well, 
maybe it's uh, useless to repeat, but I do it anyway, how important key competences are. They're really at the heart of the European education area. And we know that, and we've discussed it, I've mean, heard you saying it, uh, all the uh, roundness, let's say, the importance of having a broad set of competences for, for all, and the importance of basic skills, the importance to be prepared for the green and digital transitions, to be ready to learn uh, over life, the, the social and personal emotional skills, et cetera, et cetera. It's really in a nutshell that we need all this to be prepared for, well, for today and, and for tomorrow. So. Um, hearing what you said in this case studies, I find it really encouraging that there are so many actors and so many countries that are now engaged in the reforms and the development of key competences. And what I also hear, and, and I find it very positive, is this uh, strong and clear commitment that I've heard, especially from the countries here today, uh, presenting what they're doing. So uh, we have some really promising initiatives indeed that are underway or actually also um, planned. Um, and perhaps this study and the recommendations that uh, come out of it for policy design and, and the today's discussions that have been adding on to that, of course, I think they will provide us all, certainly for the Commission side, um, a new uh, or ample uh, or, or new uh, foods for thoughts and and possibly also ideas for further action to try to support uh, where we see the challenges are are the biggest. Um, sort of ending the day, I want to also keeping the positive spirit. So uh, although we all know that uh, the pandemic has been incredibly challenging and you have mentioned many examples here today, but Perhaps uh, what is nice to say at the end of the day or uh, at the end of the session is also how many positive developments that have also come with uh, the challenging uh, situation. And uh, some of you uh, mentioned examples, but we've seen, of course, the big leap here into uh, improving digital skills uh, and actually some big willingness, um, not least uh, with existing, but also resources planned in our resilience and recovery plans on digital infrastructure. So this is really positive and I sh I'm sure it would not have happened that quickly if we wouldn't have had uh, the pandemic. Um, also the uh, the emergency learning that we perhaps witnessed more in the beginning uh, of the pandemic, it really brought this importance of relationships and, and the engagement that schools, of course, and teachers have a really strong role for that. And, and the whole debate and the focus of student and teachers well-being has come into the spotlight. And I'm, I'm not sure it would have happened as quickly either if, if it wouldn't be for this, uh, for this development. And not the least to say this is very closely linked, of course, with the personal and social competences that are a really important part of our um, key competences recommendation. And then adding on to that, a lot of positive collaboration uh, can, that we have seen experiences between schools themselves, between schools and, uh, and the private sector, between schools, of course, with the public and governmental authorities. And so there's a new uh, kind of new partnerships created and uh, perhaps also a new sense of uh, trust. And I think many of you actually mentioned the word trust several times, how important it is. And the trust, of course, also goes with uh, all the uh, actors uh, that will make this happen. So I think it's important for the next steps to really build on these positive developments. And, uh, and of course, we, have, we should not forget that our education and training systems, they have to be inclusive. We will not uh, have any successes if what we are offering here is not for everybody. So key competences have to be for all uh, from an early age and throughout life. So the whole life learning element also is a good reminder. Um, now the Commission, and I think uh, Ulrike mentioned it and um, Mikael also in his intervention, I mean the Commission really stands ready here to, to support member states in all these efforts. And we have a number of, uh, of tools to our disposal and uh, um, we are ready to, uh, to mobilize the different tools and, and the support um, measures that, that we can help with. Um, and we, we hope that it's useful already with this study, actually, uh, as support for policymakers and other stakeholders. And as you heard also from um, uh, my colleague Ulrike, she also uh, shared a number of recent initiatives and others that are planned for the future. So 
as you see, the whole spectrum of key competencies, it is much more than the recommendation. It has a little bit of uh, trickling out to other initiatives that either are recent or, or will be coming. So the whole core discussion of key competencies is definitely going to continue. And I cannot say uh, these last words without also encouraging you to use the many opportunities that the new, well, since one year new Erasmus Plus program provides. Um, you know the program has grown, we have almost a double budget than the previous programming period, so there are definitely a lot of opportunities, both for mobility, clearly, students and, uh, and for, for um, teachers and staff exchanges, but a lot of possibilities for partnerships and projects uh, for developing in innovative uh, policies, materials, resources and tools, etc. Now, uh, we are also um, planning to put a lot of emphasis on uh, actually also, I would say, key competences because we are under, since 1st of January, we are under the European Year of Youth, which is really also a, um, a good uh, or a possibility, an opportunity to put some visibility to uh, all this work that in the end benefit uh, many people, all citizens, but in particular, it benefits uh, young people. So we can also use the fact the European Year of Youth to put some spotlight on, on all of this work. Um, and indeed, the work will continue. Um, I really would like just to thank again uh, everybody who participated today. And I find the study really interesting. It has uh, uh, it will help us in the developing the work. And thanks a lot for for the contributions today, your interest, and, and we hope the commitment, and wishing perhaps uh, all a good start or a good continuation with your own work on key competence development. We look forward to hear the progress when uh, we find the next moment. So all the best. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sophia, for these concluding remarks. Uh, also from our side, thank you very much to all participants for active participation. Thank you for all the panelists and presenters. Um, we will uh, take your inputs today into account and, and we will finalize the study and it will be published uh, very soon. Uh, I can't promise any exact date, but, but very soon. So uh, we will keep you posted. And uh, that's it from our side. Uh, I wish you all uh, a lovely evening and uh, thank you again for participating in this conference.